Okay, so we are back, and we're gonna do our best to get through all of the many items that are useful in your climb into ultimate. Now, as I said before in the first part, please check out the popper guide to see what kind of items will help you climb to get to this point. But we're gonna be covering a little bit of that as a, a tiny, tiny bit of preview for those kind of... I, I guess for those looking for what would be considered more endgame from that list, but I do recommend checking out the popper guide in general. So, this part of the video is gonna be focusing on Almost literally nothing but drops. We're going to very briefly touch upon things to take in from pre-ultimate that are considered endgame. And otherwise, we're going to break down item for item what is useful. So before we go into that, we have a couple things that you need to understand. Because otherwise, I'm going to be repeating myself over and over and over again. So... I want to make sure that everybody knows what monster parts are and photon crystals. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to close the guide briefly because we don't need to look at it at this moment. We're going to go to a quest called the Unsealed Door as a reminder for people that have not done this quest before. So essentially, by clearing through these five quests from Battle Training, Claiming a Stake, Magnitude, Metal, Secret Delivery, Doc Secret Plan, you are there able to do an either Dr. Osto's research or I usually do the Unsealed Door due to how it works out. You can convert enemy part weapons into something that's usable. So an easy example would be something like the S-Beat Blades, or potentially something like a uh, Bringer's Arm in Ultimate. So from that perspective, there are some endgame items, so I'll just put one in the bottom right hand corner as your reference. There are a couple weapons that are initially those enemy components and require you to do the single-player quests in order to talk to Dr. Montague and convert these into usable weapons. There's not a whole ton of them, but be aware that there are some that are good. There's one that's extremely good with spearing, and most of the other ones are just more useful for climbing. So be aware that that is there. The other thing I want to talk about are Photon Crystals. So Photon Crystals can take these monster weapons that you just created, and essentially by clearing a combination of uh, things for Claire's Deal 5... Jump to where is it? Which is by clearing up to 9-5 in the Government Story Quest, you're able to basically add, based off of a percent chance, additional hit. So normally, for example, if you were to make this Bringer's Rifle, as an example, it will come with all zeros, always. However, by spending crystals, increasing gradually for every one additional in cost, it lowers the success rate by 20%. So for example, at one crystal, the first time you do it, it succeeds, it, costs, it gives you 10 hit. The second time you do it, it raises it to 20 hit, but at only an 80% chance, then it goes all the way down to 20%. So these are the weapons that you can guaranteed put hit on, and some of them are really great and shareable between characters. So be aware that this is a process that requires a mix of playing potentially other episodes to get those monster parts, and you have to be doing episode 4, not necessarily ultimate, but at least part of episode 4 in fighting the usually lizards uh, in order to get those photon crystals. So just be aware, there's a full list of the eligible weapons here. We'll only be talking about a handful of these, in particular the Brands Launcher later on, uh, that are useful to stat up. That's number one. Let's go back to the guide. The next point I'm going to kind of mention are set items. So there are items that benefit in terms of additional ATA or ATP or other kind of little mini bonuses only when they are combined with other things. So I will generally mark them with the uh, square brackets of set. Similarly, monster part items I'm going to mark with square brackets so that way I don't have to keep repeating it. And there's also one other major category of items, which is the sealed items. So sealed items, which we'll talk about, and zip to the link here, so let's hide that for now, are for only four specific items in the game. However, they require a pretty large amount of kills. So you'll see 23,000 here, 20,000 for Swordsman lore. The way this is typically done, if I had to summarize it, is you take a very basic quest, like your uh, Beyond the Horizon in Episode 4, which is mentioned here, and you do it on normal difficulty. 
Or if you have a really good ranger and you're able to... You're easily, or even to some extent, Gafoe works here. Let's say you don't have access to episode 4 because you're doing, uh, uh like a classic kind of mode. Uh, Cow's Clock Challenge on episode 2 is super, super solid for it. I prefer Beyond the Horizon, honestly, but Cow's Clock Challenge is a pretty close second. And definitely, if you don't have any forces, it's, it's still pretty good. So anyway, just be aware that these exist, and in order for them to become their super form, so... For example, Limiter will reduce all your stats, and then Adip becomes this absolute god unit that raises basically everything, especially ATA and, and cuts TP consumption. Like, these items can get really, really, really upgraded if you get the kills. So often you'll bring a character like a Hugh Duel, for example, to hold onto Swordsman lore in order to do it, or you'll have a force with a power mag, ironically spamming Gafoe as MST kills in order to wield something like a Lame to Argent. So just be aware uh, that those items exist. So if I mention sealed, it's talking about these four items that require the kills. Let's go back to the god. So finally, there's kind of a special category which I call anti-air. So there's some that can be used to hit flying targets very easily. Now granted, there are weapons that can hit characters in the air, like gun, like handgun or mech gun. But there are certain weapons that go a little above and beyond, where they have some kind of property to them, whether it's infinite vertical height, or ridiculously boosted height, the ability to ignore movement evade from enemies, some combination of these things means that you could probably snipe them out of the air. It's recommended you get at least one anti-air option if you're planning to do uh, episode 4 with a ranger in particular, uh, so that way you could deal with things like the zoos, for example, and basically any of those weapons will work, but let it be known that there are situations where you can still hit the target with something like a mech gun. So just be aware, it's situational when you have other weapons, but it is guaranteed with these anti-airs. So it's kind of a trade-off of speed, comfort, versus guarantee. So I'm not going to go into many of these items in super detail. I covered this very extensively in the Popper Guide. I'm going to mention just a handful of items and pop them up for basically your recollection. But basically we have the equivalency of something called the S-Beat oh, Blade, so we'll pop that up in a moment here. So we'll just leave in the in the bottom right, I won't go to the main page of them. So essentially these are things that are just really easy hell daggers to get. So if you're looking for some way to clear certain areas, it is the only way to get guaranteed 50 hit because you just keep getting Photon Crystals, you pump it up, it's usable by Hunters and Rangers, and it's it's decent for that. You'll eventually replace it with other things, but that item will let you go far. Up next, we have a gun known as the Master Raven. So the intent behind it is that it is a single shot only. So instead of a three-hit combo, it's you get one shot, but that shot splits into three shots. So you go pop, 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 over and over and over again. So at high ATP, it's really good, uh, potentially for doing like real quick burst damage. However, downsides to this gun obviously can't combo. Uh, it also has some accuracy issues. So normally you could kind of compensate uh, late game accuracy, for example, on something like a Hugh cast by getting hit percentage on your weapons. Sadly, it can't do this. So just be aware that it is required for you to do Black Paper's Dangerous Deal 2 or Dangerous deal with black paper, depending on what translation you're looking at. Um, but otherwise, a solid option for male characters. We're going to talk about Last Swan, which is another one that you could have picked up prior. Again, if you want to see more details, check out the proper guide when we go over these items. But just as a short recap, uh, Last Swan, fantastic weapon, and it's basically used on Hugh Seal and to some extent Rock Seal all the time. It's a triple shot weapon with pistol animation. So if you fire three times, you get nine hits. Again, sadly, it has more of an accuracy issue than Master Raven, which I think had 20 extra ATA over it, if I was looking at that correctly earlier. So it can be a little tricky to land it, so that's why it's usually only preferred on the Hunters and Rangers to kind of compensate that lower accuracy. So the other thing that I'm going to mention here are the armors. So you're going to see me talk about these, and I just want to use this as kind of a segue. 
this to get the proper one. So the D parts uh, version 1.01 are part of a group of armors that we call the ATP boosters. So they're generally speaking, as you're climbing, you'll probably play more defensively. You're not used to the game. You want items with like really good resistance. You want items with really good defense. The true end game of PSO, you shouldn't be hit by much. Everything should die nearly instantly. So you'll probably go back and hunt for armors like these later down the line. You might not get them immediately and very hard, but as you're kind of going to the midway point of ultimate, you'll probably return back to hard or very hard to get these items. Like for example, this item specifically uh, was I believe a 1 in 160 from Bullclaw on hard mode. So this is a pretty easy armor to pick up, and if you don't mind playing a little more glass cannon in exchange for big damage, uh, it's a pretty big pickup. Now the real reason why I had to do the previously on uh, popper guide here is that I feel like if new force players were looking at this guide first, they wouldn't understand just how many raw items are only on the lower difficulties or only worth hunting through here. Like, I'm not going to go through summaries of all of these. I will just briefly state these. You should only be using these as forces, number one. Number two, you have the Club Laconium, Mace of Adamin, Club of which all boost the basic techs, which are okay. You'll phase them out of ultimate and or you'll stop using them, depending on where you're at. Then you have things like Fire Scepter, Agni, Ice Staff, Storm on Indra. So these things uh, boost 20% to the intermediate level techniques, so all of the... Or not intermediate techniques, it boosts all of the techniques of the associated elements. So Foey, Gafoey, and Rafoey are all boosted by Agni, Storm One would be same thing of Zon, Gazan, Razond, etc. So these are things that are considered poor in Ultimate. These do not these do not climb in Ultimate without these. Please spend some time getting these. These in particular are very easy to pick up, and you can look at our Papa guide for all the locations of these. Um, one thing where it's arguable whether or not you spend a lot of time on it are the elemental merges or the things that add 30% tech boost, the specific things. So at some point during your adventure in Ultimate, and ultimately, <laughs> fun I guess, it'll be up to you when you get these. But if you're planning on doing a lot of Episode 1 and a lot of Episode 4 is Force over and over and over again, you cannot go wrong by going backwards finding out which ID and difficulty combination gives you red barriers, blue barriers, and yellow barriers in order to then get the corresponding amplifier. So you basically have the barrier equip and then you use the amplifier on it to give it a bonus. So it'll go from red barrier, use amplifier Rafoe, it becomes a Rafoe merge. So these things are super crucial for speed clears. Uh, they have extremely low level requirements. Technically you might already have them if you're lucky. But yeah, definitely take a look and hunt those. Pink ID in particular gets them pretty much everywhere. So it's kind of like the de facto force ID if you're just looking for, if I'm only gonna play force and I refuse to play anything else, pink ID is probably what you would start in that scenario. But we'll probably talk about section IDs a bit later since again, it's very subjective. Then finally, there's a lot of elemental cloaks, I'd like to call them, or armors that give you a benefit towards a particular, um, thing. So essentially, things like the Ignition Cloak, Tempest Cloak, and Congeal Cloak, most people get on the lower difficulties. So potentially between all of these things, before you even enter Ultimate, if you were being optimal, let's say you just were playing a Force doing Episode 4, doing Force things, you might have an Ignition Cloak, which is 10% to all fire, Fire Scepter, which adds 20% to all fire, and you might have Gafoe merge, which is 30% to Gafoe. So you have 30% boosted fire attacks and your Gafoe is plus 60%. That's pretty much as good as you're gonna get. So I do recommend that if you're a force, you are probably gonna have to check the popper guide more than the other classes, because so many of your other core items are here. Not all of them. And we'll go over the ones that aren't in uh, very hard mode. But just be aware that there's just so many good options that you could have picked up coming into ultimate. Finally, we have one that's kind of difficulty adjacent. You need a lot of money in order to do the 1k core and gambles. Uh, but essentially, if you do gamble on certain days, depending on the Affinia server, again, check out the location for the gambles in the Popper Guide, uh, you will get a shield that's 33 defense, 33 to all resist, 30% boost to Razan, 
and it also occasionally, I think it's like 10% or less, has a chance of blocking a hit that would normally hit you. So just a fantastic overall defensive shield that only requires, I think, level 33 to use. Is the gimmick is all threes. So again, very easy pickups. If you don't have these, go back. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. Go back. You don't need all of them, per se. At minimum, I would say, you know, your basic elemental scepters, maybe one of these cloaks, at definitely three seals. There's, there's no excuse to skip three seals. Yeah, it's always good to check. You never know when they can change it in the future. I guess I could technically put Corin's prize pool as a link in here, but we're, we're not going to check that out. Our purpose is not to go over that. We went over that in Popper Guide. So here are a couple other units that are just quick quality of life as a reminder from Popper's Guide that I think do carry over pretty much all the way through to Ultimate. Um, I would have at minimum a god battle coming into very hard mode. You will get some options to replace it. We'll talk about those options at Heavenly Battle V101 or Blue Dishy Violet Nibidau. But it's not super hard to pick up, to be honest. So if, if your only option for the ID is V101 and Mines, you need to be able to kill things to get to mines. So even though like this is like purely a good upgrade, you still need to be able to get there. So just be aware of that. I recommend at least a god battle. The cure units can also be done from Corrin's prize pool. Basically everything but cure poison is useful. So again, I'm not going to go into details with them. I've listed here scenarios why you would use them, like dealing with Dorfon using Confuse, or uh, Cure Freeze versus Falls, Marissa's, etc. We talked about that in the previous part for the most part, where these things come up. Um, minus, I think, maybe Cure Slow, because that was not a new gimmick for Falls. But yeah, check this out. We Check it out. <laughs> 1k gambles are strong. Uh, finally, one thing you might have been able to pick up on a lower difficulty. Doesn't matter, you can also farm it in ultimate, is the Dragon Scale. Uh, this is kind of like an endgame mag cell. So essentially, if you're playing a Ramar and you're looking to create a mag that doesn't have a 45 in depth because they cap much earlier than other characters do, you're going to need something that gets them into a special evolution. And usually Dragon Scale is the meta choice for that. So it has some bonuses when you hold something known as the Excalibur. It doesn't really matter. It just has really good invincibility procs. So we compare that against some of the other uh, options in Popper Guide. So again, take a look at that as needed. And similarly, the only available on very hard mode, uh, I guess technically it's a cell, the Heaven Striker Coat can create the Striker Unit. Now you can't get the weapon easily in lower difficulties. I think maybe it's in a black paper deal. It's been a while. It's not recommended to do that, though. The recommended way to get Heaven Striker is to play through Ultimate Difficulty. So you will find Heaven Striker by playing Ultimate Difficulty, and then it will make the rest of the game very easy. So we'll go into great details. If that does not make any sense to you, do not worry. We'll go We'll we'll go hit that little pass when we uh, get deeper in. So let's define the different phases of... Um, I guess are item groupings. So I'll read the disclaimer a little bit. So just to be clear, most of the time I will include all options of the hunt, but not always. I will try to focus on the ones where it is really good. There are certain low level hunts where you can hunt it from anything and it's fine and those will match. But please always consult the wiki to see whatever the latest drops are. Or if you're not playing on Affinia, these IDs will not be relevant to you, so you need to check on whatever server you're playing, as an example. But the intent behind this is that if you pick up these items, these are going to be like what I consider almost like, maybe not always 100% core, but the bare minimum needed to climb. So you potentially have a lot of good force gear coming from very hard into ultimate. You might have some weapons, maybe if you've been doing Restless Lion as per previous guides part, uh, talking to... Uh, talking about getting those common weapons with Hell or Charge with potentially 30% hit, which increases the 50% ultimate. So you might have some good weapons, maybe. Maybe. But if not, we'll go over some of the absolutely beautiful items that will carry you the rest of the way. So let's start with the, the first major one. So we have the Disca of Brave Man, which we're going to put in the corner in just a moment. 
But basically, the Diska of Brain Man is incredibly powerful. It is an absolute endgame item, even before you get an armor known as 13, which it has a set bonus with. It is usable by everybody. More importantly, it gets a 50% boost to weapon attack power, 10% attack speed, which is not relevant, and 30% or 30 ATA when you have it with 13. So basically makes your hunter as accurate as a ranger, your ranger never misses, and your force as accurate as a hunter. That's the best way of thinking of it. It's like upgrading an entire class tier for free. This item does everything that you want it to do. You ideally want to find it with some hit percentage, but getting it with some percents towards things that can harm you, like if you're looking to clear a lot of forests, it doesn't hurt to get extra native, for example. Um, but yeah, th this is the end-all be-all weapon. The reason why it's so good, not only does it get a huge bonus from the set of 13, but it hits four targets, it has the Berserk special, and it's really, really, really easy to hunt. There's a lot of chances, again, check the Pupper Guide for very hard runs, uh, to get it on the lower difficulties, but even throughout playing the different areas, like, Red ID can just immediately get it. White ID can just immediately get it in Forest. So while not every location listed here is relevant for um, the climb into, I would say, the higher difficulties, like, you're not necessarily going to go straight to CCA, for example, <laughs> in order to hunt this. But later on, when you're checking for other items, it's good to know that this is here. So just be aware, there are many options to get this, both on Very Hard and Ultimate. But generally speaking, Red ID and White ID get the most overall options. Let's scroll a little further. So up next, we have the Red Handgun, which is another really fantastic weapon. I think I was sleeping on this weapon for a while. Like, I had them, but I didn't use them appropriately. And the reason why this gun is really good is it has phenomenal ATP. So we can see in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, it gets a grind of 50. It has a flat damage range, so it does 350 ATP total, if you combine those numbers together. Usable by all classes, decently high ATA. And why this is end up being used is that because of its raw power, before you get to the point where you're able to consistently use your 50 hit charge ray guns and everything else, Sometimes you just kind of need damage, and this gun is super, super, super common in the earlier areas. So, you know, green, purple, red, yellow, all get them in forest, cave gets them in uh, white ID. And essentially, from that standpoint, you get a pretty solid weapon before you get your 50 hit charge collection if you're doing a self found thing. And on top of that, it's still meta to use on bosses. So, for example, uh, Vault Op Phase 1 only cares about your weapon damage, which we discussed in the previous part to great length. But this is a handgun version that you can use on any character in order to slow down the little head going between the monitors. It also enables one shot of the Fowl's Spinners in case you're looking to uh, control any of the spinner phase as another class. And just due to its raw ATP mixed with potentially some dark percentage, it does actually pretty good damage versus bosses too. So if you're, if you're there with only like maybe a 10 hit Vulcan, or maybe you don't even have a charge Vulcan, maybe you didn't know to hunt it by the time you went to this video, um, this, this gun is pretty much the savior of the early ultimate, and you'll still use it to some extent on casts, of course. So up next, we have the Red Saber. Now this is kind of an interesting weapon. This is one where it's, it's okay as is. If you like the Saber weapons, it's not bad. Essentially, it's usable by all classes, it's got decently high ATP. The reason it's used is because it stacks with a few other things. So for this one specifically, I'm going to show this, so I want the chat to witness the, the bonuses here. Let me hide the guide for a moment. So, oops, wrong thing. So for the Red Saber itself, essentially, it combines with up to three different items. Only one of them is super relevant. So Red Coat is okay if you're trying to get into uh, Bull Op Killing Phase earlier. Otherwise, the, the meta choice is the Crimson Coat. Essentially, you probably should not be fighting Bolt Op for a while, because mines I consider kind of like middle to beginning of the end game content for forces. But this is one of their highest damaging uh, weapons for Fonu. Actually, it is the 
highest, I believe. Yeah, it is the highest uh, for phone rules. So, for example, if you have 78 grinders, it's like, what, roughly about 550? But then you boost the weapon ATP, you get almost Excalibur level ATP, which that weapon I think is 800 or so. It's very silly. That's your just sense. Has any plans to do full playthrough of story mode? Another quest I'm smart to finish? No. I don't intend to do that, sorry. But I think from the si at least not at least not any time now. May maybe in a couple of years I'll think about it. But overall, the reason why this weapon is used is just due to that Volt Op glitch. Otherwise, it's just kind of okay. It's generally not recommended to use the Saber type unless it's very, very specific ones. Just be aware that that's there. Uh, finally, potentially uh, early on. So most of these are kind of forest grabbable rares. Uh, we can do things like Asteron Belt, for example. So if you're able to at least reach the cave boss, Blue ID gets them pretty easily. The reason why it's pretty strong is just from the fact that, uh, one, it provides a defense bonus, which is absolutely fantastic uh, for force characters that's surviving some of the harder areas. It's also usable by only males, but sadly not Faux Newman. Rip Faux Newman. I get... You know what's kind of weird about that too, chat? Like, the requirement is 800 ATP. I feel like Faux Newman should have been able to use this. I didn't really think about this until just now. Wait, why can't he use this? My mind is blown, chat. <laughs> Today I learned. Why can he not? He could use Excalibur though, right? Hold on. Small aside. Yeah. What's up with that? What's up with that, chat? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> chat, are we gonna have to petition Affinia? Sorry for the, the aside. <laughs> what? Same reason why Heatmar can't use Cleo? Welcome, Hell Cleave. <laughs> so, <laughs> I got distracted by that. I was like, why? But why though? <laughs> but anyway, for some reason the Faux Newman can't use it, question mark. Who knows? Maybe in the future by the time you watch this video, maybe maybe someone will hashtag free Asteron Belt. I mean, come on. <laughs> Kind of whatever at that point. But anyway, it's just it's a very strong base weapon. <laughs> Poor Humar. It's it's a pretty welcome Dango also. So it's a pretty strong base weapon. It's really, really strong on Fomar in particular. Uh just because it is just raw damage. It's not too hard to farm. It's one of those ones where it's it's a nice to have. If you truly have no other charge weapons, it will be your climb ability. And technically, if you're playing blue ID, it's not bad against the worm boss you get it from. It's not bad. I don't think it's quite in the same tier as like a fully kitted out Disco Brave Man or like Red Hand Gun, for example. Uh, but it's a solid choice. Up next, we have the Rambling May. So again, the intent between for this one is to make sure. In fact, I'll hide this one specifically. Always forget that I'd have to do it in two windows. Uh, this one does have a set bonus. I don't know if it's like super worth it. It's it's an okay set bonus. Like it provides a lot, but I would only really use the set bonus on forces. So if you combine it with safety heart, it gets a thirty accuracy boost. And it, I guess it's also not bad for hunters, but generally rangers will be using an item called Ranger Wall, which is another great popper choice, which. I don't remember if it was on the earlier list, but it will be by the time the video comes out, I'll put it that way. If it's not there, I'm going to go back and retroactively add it. But anyway, from that standpoint, it's a weapon that only hits a single target, it uses a shotgun animation, but due to the way Fomoral works, essentially, she's able to take advantage of her animation, which goes faster than a pistol, I'm pretty sure. To shoot a pistol range gun with really high ATP, even higher than red hand gun. And it also potentially has a special that's usable. Most people don't use a special, but the double hit property, the fact that it hits like nearly infinitely up and down, this is like the Fomarl's main weapon. You do not play Fomarl without this weapon. This is like priority number one. <laughs> like as soon as you come into ultimate, you're like, I want, I need a rambling May, period. You'd prefer to get hit percentage, but it scales extremely well with the other percentages since it's just an overly, like, a generally really strong weapon. 
and sadly no grind, but the double hit feature means that she's going to be able to combo kill stuff that she would not normally be able to do. It can be used by characters like the Hugh Neural and Hugh Casile in a pinch. For example, if you're trying to stop a dive bombing zoo and you just don't have mech gun damage to deal with it, it's an okay option for it. So just be aware that those things exist. As I mentioned before, I'm not going to go into like a whole bunch of the runs. I will note that this one is specifically episode 2 only, so you're, you're going to have to be fighting Rappies or Mill Lilies. Just kind of a mixed bag. The other weapon that I really recommend that you go into is the Vivian. The Vivian is the other absolute clutch melee weapon for, I would say, the Hugh Castile, Hugh Neural, Fomoral, and honestly, to some extent, the Faux Neural. Uh, it's just extremely high ATP. The fact that it multi-hits is crazy. Uh, the set bonus is not really relevant. It gets attack speed, but you should be wielding Heavenly Battle or higher, ideally, by the time you leave early difficulty. So you would not explicitly get the armor to get the set bonus for this. So just be aware it's another one where it really benefits you playing Episode 2. The pink ID really wins out here, so Fomarl is like in love with that. Although technically Fomar also in love with Slicer or Disco Brain Man, so it is what it is there. Anyway, let's go and go back to the gun. Oh, I'll, I'll leave Vivian up in the corner, I guess. For those that wanted to see the stats again. But Heavenly Battle units is usable by everybody. It's a 40% attack speed, which is so good. Let's do Genesis. Thank you for any Finia Gods, like materials, characters, and controller ones. No problem. Glad they helped you out. Uh, but essentially, this, this is like the ultimate item you're going to be using for pretty much the whole game until you're ready for endgame. So this is the highest attack speed boost you could get in the game. The reason it's not used over other options at true endgame is that other items like V101 are basically hev heavenly battle, but also does this. Or Blue Doshi Violet Nibidao is... I have Heavenly Battle on my armor, is the best way to, to explain it. But it's it's really recommended if you're only doing self-found, these are the IDs you could find it on. In Forest, it's Red ID Hildelts. Mines, you could get it for Viridian. Ruins, Deldi, Orange, kind of brutal for a hunt, honestly, if you're only doing self-found. And Dwarfon on Purple, Red, and Orange isn't too terrible to pick up. But these are one of the items which you should probably trade for, honestly. And we'll be going through a more intensive trade guide, not tonight, and not in this video. But I promise you that is the next guide that we have. In fact, it's already done. Do a little, little sneak preview, go, whoa, load it, ooh, it's there. But anyway, we'll go there in the future. Uh, the other thing that is used basically from level 1 to basically 190-something are Heavenly Arms. So heavenly Arms are units that give... <laughs> UTs, yeah, something like that. So, these things give 25 accuracy. Phenomenal. This is used on every character, period. One of the best units in the game. You want as many of these as possible. The goal is to stack, you get one heavenly battle, because battles don't stack, and as many arms as you can have. So basically, think of it this way. If you had a 20% chance of hitting the enemy with a certain attack, if you then, on the first hit, have three heavenly arms instead, you are now at a 95% accuracy with the same attack. It is game-changing how good this accuracy is. It only scales even higher on the follow-up hits. So if you were only able to barely sometimes land normal, normal, heavy, you're suddenly going to be doing normal, heavy, heavy, or normal, heavy, special, depending on your accuracy break-off. So these are really, really crucial to get. These are super, super high priority. And there's characters that can get them so fast and so early. Imagine only needing to kill Whoop in Forest as like Purple ID or Sky. What, it, what an easy pickup, chat. <laughs> there is no reason not to go get this on these IDs. Like what a, what a fantastic early grab. And then finally, one of the most crucial units in the game is something known as Smart Link. So the way it works is that there's a distance penalty for Hunters and Forces if they fired a ranged weapon. 
it can get really bad. I can, I think an example, I think the sniper offhand is minus 72 to your accuracy. So if you had three heavenly arms, you only barely negate max distance sniper on one of those characters. Terrible. And guns are like in the low 40s. It's bad. So the way you kind of have to balance it is if you're using all melee, you're using just triple heavenly arms. And if you're in like short to like mid-range somewhere in between you'll hope that the heavenly arms offset the smart like penalty as you get higher level as you start hitting like your 140s your 160s and you don't need heavenly arm like triple heavenly arms to hit max accuracy you'll replace one of those with a smartling for the rest of the game this item will basically never leave you because most characters need to be able to switch between a melee and ranged option if they're playing hunter or force and it is super recommended to get so if you can't easily get a Heavenly Arms until a little later, you can try to hold off on some of the range penalties at least by picking up an early Smart Link. So definitely check out the Hildelts on Pink ID, or potentially Zoos on Blue or Purple, uh, depending on if you're a Force. Again, Forces have a lot easier time doing that. I wouldn't consider that an early game hunt for Hunter Ranger, but again, Forces dominate Episode 4, they don't really care. So let's talk about Jaya. Jaya is a ridiculous weapon that you can get as early as hard mode. And it seems kind of unassuming. It's got kind of low stats, like 160 to 220 ATP, only grinds up to 15. It's like half of the ATP of the items that we talked about earlier, but it gives a 5.56 times multiplier whenever you do the special attack. So you combine all of your heavenly arms and you're willing to sacrifice 10k, you're gonna play Whack-A-Mole. Whatever you swing at is probably dead. <laughs> like, honestly, I don't think anything can survive a true Jaya combo, even at low levels, unless it is, unless you are like heinously, heinously understated. The damage this thing can do is insane. Getting potentially things like A, B, and hit percentage on this, uh, make the worm boss an absolute joke. You can literally kill this boss in just like six combos with just Jaya. Like it is completely insane at high level. And it's also really good at clearing horrible enemy groups like Sinnohs. <laughs> when you just when you just want to freeze trap one shot everything. Just feel like, okay. So blue ID gets this basically everywhere, but be aware that on lower difficulties, Viridian Pink and Yellow can also get it on very hard, or potentially hard, depending on the ID. Again, see the popper guide for that. Uh, the only other, I would say, hunter-only weapon that's worth mentioning is the Flow and Sword 3084. So the reason why this one is pretty good is the fact that it also has the Spirit Special. And there's a pop-up here in the corner. I'll manually search for it. Oh, sorry, it's Flow and Sword. My apologies, small typo. So anyway, it's only attainable from one hunt, which is kind of funny, but it's it's just temple. Personic says, so just tune in. Will this spot be on YouTube? It will eventually be on YouTube. Be aware it's going to be probably about a week or so. But the full VOD will be up on Twitch, of course. But anyway, continuing onwards with the sword. So it is a pretty moderately powerful 300 to 320 ATP uh, item that grinds 85, so it has actually a fantastic grind compared to some other items. And most importantly, it has spirit. So if you're playing your Humar, you're playing your Hugh Newroll, it's a really strong alternative to some of the harder to hunt items. And this will probably carry you to the end game portions of Ultimate. I'm not going to say it's the best possible option, but it is really good if you get it with even just like a little bit of hit percentage. Like, honestly, even 15 hit is probably good enough in solo. Probably need more like 30 or so for multiplayer, but for single player play, it's just fantastic. And again, combine that with potentially freeze traps or frozen shooters. You're just gonna whack and smack and kill everything. It's very fun to use. Probably one of the only swords I'll recommend in the game, since I'm not a big fan of Caliber, but we gotta give credit where credit is due. It's fantastic. Also, it gives five luck for some reason. A little bonus. Here we go, Chad. You knew it was coming. We're talking about early game pickups. Of course, we're going to talk about Frozen Shooter. Sure. 
Should Red Sword be there also? Um... I was content. I, I think from my standpoint, I don't put it under the critical items. So let me back up slightly. So these are the general ATP pickups. I think I list it under situational. I could elevate it out of there. Let me go downward slightly. Oh, is it not in situational either? It's okay. Did I delete it by accident? Oh no, it's there. I think this should be lower. Yeah, I think that's just in the wrong category. Good call. I guess I could put it in the major category. It's fine. Let's put it here. Give me one second. Ah. We'll we'll fix the we'll fix the flow of it a little more. I thought I had that under situational, I think I forgot to move it. Put it here for now. Yeah, it, it was on the list. I think it was just a little too deep in the list. So the reason originally I think I originally had it in so we'll hold off on frozen shooter, we'll go backwards slightly. Let's talk about Red Sword. So the reason Red Sword is pretty solid is that it has a really big damage range. We'll go fix the groups here. So for example, a lot of these are cave hunts. So from our perspective, you have the Nano Dragon uh, with Viridian, which is pretty good. Um, you can technically get it from the Golvermers, which are Sky IDs, which are not bad. You have Melqueaks, which you can get it from Redria, Yellow Boss. Or White Ill. So, I think from that perspective, it goes up, I would say, in usefulness uh, for Hugh and Hugh Castile, because it transitions from being your damage weapons, uh, or excuse me, your early damage choice, comparatively. So, for example, they can't use Spirit from Red Sword, so this is not a bad one to list here. I'll, I'll put it here. I think this is fine. But basically, from that perspective, you know, it's just a giant beat stick. It has C's, which is a pretty good special. You cast in Hugh Castiles as a reminder, uh, all casts in general actually get a bonus towards Paralysis. So they can actually land this a decent amount of the time. The downside is the accuracy is only okay. 37 accuracy is... it's fine, but without real hit percentage, it's probably not going to be used for that purpose, sadly. It also sadly doesn't have some synergy with a very specific item later on. If this synergized with Proof of Sword Saint, I would have a very different opinion on this item. Yeah, we'll be touching on uh, Zamba and Yan Chang for sure. So this is kind of like your early beat stick option. So there's a good call, Hellcleave. I'm going to move it up here. But anyway, now let's go back to Frozen Shooter. So from that perspective, we saw it a little earlier. So it's special, has infinite vertical range. 100% chance to freeze an enemy as long as you hit it. Uh, Anti-airs, its it basically does everything. It even upgrades technically into a weapon called Snow Queen. I don't think for the most part that matters as much. I guess I can mention it here. I hit percentage, frozen shooter, and be combined with, I think it's Photon Booster, yeah, Photon Booster. Uh, for pure endgame. Otherwise, standard. Frozen shooter preferred. In most scenarios. So I'll just make note of that. So I, I don't think I go into a lot of details with Snow Queen specifically. Uh, I'll, I'll mention it here, just because I mentioned it just in general. Uh, but basically, it's not an item you can hunt. You just combine a Photon Booster with the... Frozen Shooter, and it gets rid of its ability to combo, and it requires kind of high accuracy, which is unfortunate. So, most people will not use the Snow Queen for that purpose, I will mention it. But honestly, even an all-zeroed Frozen Shooter is just ridiculous. It The ability... The, obviously, hit is preferred, because it's your ability to hard shut down most enemies in the game. But man, oh man, it is just such a powerful sniper. 
Not in terms of ATP. ATP 250, which is kind of below average compared to the other items we've seen. But one cannot understate the utility and the ability to clear safely that this weapon brings to every single run is truly fantastic. So if you're playing Forest with any green, purple, yellow, white ID, there is no reason for you to not go hunt one of these. They are absolutely broken and fantastic. Hulkleaf saying frozen shooter hit mainly needed for Seabed and Tower anyways, exactly. So unless the enemy has like extremely atrocious evade, most of the time your near max ATA is good enough even in multiplayer. Like it, it's just really solid. It sadly doesn't work on like mini bosses, most mini bosses, asterisk, asterisk. Um, but when it does work, it's just, it's beautiful. Being able to shut down something like an Ilgil is amazing so good. So let's talk briefly about the Rhianov. This one is more kind of a... It, if it rolls decent, it's good. Honestly, I would say before you get the other items, I would rate it higher. I thought about putting this one in situational. It's a pretty easy hunt. All you have to do is kill Dragon as green ID or technically do anything above ground. You fight the rare Pazuzu uh, on green ID as well. It's basically as a heavy attack. It has a piercing shot. So that way, it can hit multiple body parts at once. And it's actually decent at it. Um, it's not super hard for it to get A beast and hit percentage. It's hard for it to get both well, but it's a 550 gun. It's probably going to be better than most other options you have at this point. So if you pick it up, I would say give it a shot, I suppose. I sadly never drop had one drop of interest in time for me to use it. Yeah, it, it has some situational use versus uh, the worm boss. I would say this is probably lower in, in priority if your goal is not to level in towards the future. As I think, generally speaking, people will either do a lot of dragon resets, which we mentioned in the previous part, or they'll try to just push as far as they can in TTF before it becomes, like, abysmal. So they'll, like, oh, I can beat dragon really easy, now let me do caves. Okay, now I have weapons for caves, let me do uh, mines, and then regret life choices. But, you know... It just depends, I guess, mostly on your TTF priority. Because otherwise, you don't really use this on any other enemies. Speaking of fantastic, if it drops with, like, basically any hit percentage. What a ridiculous gun. So this one's usable by all classes, for some reason. <laughs> it's a shotgun animation, which means the Fomarl shoots really fast with this again, for some reason. This one's also pretty funny. I don't know why. I don't prefer it over Rambling May. If I got a high hit percentage, it's more useful in forces. But honestly, putting this on like a Huka Seal isn't the worst thing ever. And Rangers have like already pretty good accuracy, so putting it on them mostly just needs it to have like good weapon percentage versus hit percentage. Sadly, uh, it does really, really well with Humar and Hucast in particular, but only when it is hit percentage. So. It's potentially a really solid solo clear item, so I'll give an example. So it could be used on falls, on basically any phase that you want, because it has fantastic range. It could be used on things like Lily or Dragon in solo play as Ramar, where it is sometimes the preferred item to just one-tap everything. So it really just depends on how far in you are, but I feel like this item goes up in value the higher ATP you have. The fact that it fires five shots instead of three is also a big draw. So even though it can't combo, which is sad, uh, being able to hit five shots is usually good enough on high ATP characters to kill everything. So just be aware of this option. Might not be the best at climbing if it doesn't roll decent, but it's something that when you get more towards the middle of ultimate, you'll probably be happy that you have it. And again, this is a fantastic boss clear. So De Rolle drops it on Viridian, which is usually where I see it. Only because I do a lot of TTF, <laughs> you know that's how it is. So here we go, chat. You ready for the you ready for the uh, force best weapon? Stop wearing weapons. <laughs> Reminder, chat. Please be unarmed when you're casting most things, unless you have a really strong elemental boost. The reason being that it allows for faster casting, it allows for stun locks. It does burn through your TP faster, but it means that things like a Foey stacking are generally a little stronger, assuming that you're using things like support weapons in your hand. So please make sure to unequip if you have nothing that buffs the spell that you're using. Technically, you can also get some elemental scepters. I'll denote that they can technically drop in box runs as pink ID, 
I will denote that basically anything pink ID from forest to spaceship will drop storm wands. I don't recommend hunting them there, but they're they're technically there for you. But probably better for you to do very hard mode for those. So we mentioned these a little bit before. There are some cloaks you can find in ultimate, but the locations you get them are kind of hard unless you're already decently geared. So just be aware that like spaceship isn't like the hardest thing to get it at, but the fact that you can pick it up in very hard mode means that this is kind of like your initial starting ultimate item. So technically this one's a little cheaty to put here, but I think it's fun. Uh, finally, we just have a set of uh, core units that I think helped you to get to better units as you go forward. So we have the God HP, which fixes pretty much all of the forces problems. You'll probably be triple stacking this in some areas in order for you to go to, for example, to early episode four. It can only be hunted in Caves and Temple from Sky ID and Orange, uh, respectively. But it can also be gathered in Sky ID, I believe it's Mill Lily offhand, very hard mode. Um, but more importantly, if, you get, if it could be grabbed from the 1k core in Gambles. So these are things that you could get at any point in Ultimate, and having 240 extra health when set damage is often between 300 and 500 in the early areas means that you'll basically clear that barrier with minimal effort. Ideally, you'll have at least one on in other areas, but just be aware that that's there. Um, I think also for climbing, this is a little underrated, so we're going to give a shout out to Godmind. This is a super easy pickup from 1k Corn Gambles. For those that don't know, it's that person that's outside the weapon shop, slash shops in general in episodes 1, 2, and 4, in multiplayer mode before you accept a quest. So make sure to talk to him. 40 MST stacking that means that you can learn techniques really quickly. So if you happen to go to harder areas, this is just a way to learn it faster. Ideally, you'll also have a mind mag that's completely maxed. Ideally, something like a... A Rappy Mag, for example, with nearly maxed MST, like 15 defense, 185 MST, slash mind. Or just mind, excuse me. Uh, but yeah, having these is just really useful across all characters. It's something you unequip as soon as you're done with it, but for forces, it's going to be sitting there for a while. The only thing you really replace it with is God Technique, and the reason being is that there are a lot of spells that have upgraded animations as you get higher levels of it. So while you could hunt it in Ruins, or you could hunt it in Temple, I don't think the Temple Hunt is honestly that bad, to be honest with you, for early game. Uh, ideally, you'll gamble for the God Techniques as well. The reason this is important is because MST doesn't scale things like the buffs and debuffs or Negan. And there's a lot of runs that depend on those being higher, and or those will compensate you having a slightly weaker group of techniques. So before you have maxed out techniques, which usually sits around somewhere between level 27 and 29, uh, learned by your character, you'll have probably three god techniques <laughs> or so. And as you get higher and higher techniques, you replace the god techniques with mine just to squeeze out more damage on spells. Then you replace that with other units that we'll see later on. But these are kind of like the two core force units that you will basically put be putting on. It's more situational for like hunters and rangers, but it is very useful to get potentially a 160 MST boost in order to learn techniques. That is literally dozens of levels that you don't have to have in order to learn the technique. So I would consider that important as, as you level, even for those characters. It is completely skippable for cast though. Please don't wear it as cast. Okay. So up next we have the Fantastic. I love the name of this weapon. We got the Angry Fist. The Angry Fist is amazing. Do not doubt the power of Angry Fist, Chad. I I used to use this a long time ago, and I'm so sad. I think I got rid of my good Angry Fists. This was something when I first climbed. I had this on my... Bomar and Phonuman. The reason being that uh, I, I didn't even think about using it for Humar or Ramar, to be honest. I should have kept it for those characters. Uh, but essentially what'll happen is that Volop only cares about ATP, we've mentioned this a couple times, and this is a weapon that grants really high ATP and fist animation. So this allows for stun locks much more consistent than some other weapon types that also have high ATP. So it does have a steep requirement of 610, that's not something you're going to naturally have as an early level force. And while you can also get it on very hard, um, 
I would say for the most part, it's probably something you'll see as like a quote-unquote jump rare as you play through the different difficulties. There's a million different ways you can end up with it, like Viridian Green, Sky Blue, Pink, Orange, White, and Red all get it. So it's like, there there are a lot of options and none of them are too deep aside from Redria, to be honest. It, it's kind of like, if I want to swap into being unarmed consistently, technically you could do that. It, it's nice. Sometimes you could jokingly melee kill to save yourself some TP. It has surprisingly good accuracy. I was complaining before about the Red Sword's accuracy was like 37. Angry Fist is 62 accuracy. It's just it's just hyper accurate. I don't, I'm not really sure why. You have a high machine god hand? Yeah, it's so good. Actually, did I put god hand on the list? That's a good question. Let's find out together, chat. It is a pretty good pickup. Let's learn today, chat. I might have missed that. I'm aware of the item, but I think I just missed it. I did not. Let's go add it here, chat. We'll, we'll come back here to later. Not hand is strictly just an upgrade on this item. Stripped upgrade for melee over Angry Fist. Or Humar slash Ramar. We'll fill it in. So I think it, it can be attained from Gold Dragon, Gal Griffin, and Barbara Let's say it's it's not bad. It has, I think, about a hundred more ATP, if I were to do the math real quick. So technically, I guess I could put this earlier. I didn't realize it dropped from Barbara Ray, so I'm actually going to move where this is. So it just overall has a pretty good stat line. It adds 5 to all stats, which is also kind of a nice little bonus. But I think overall, chat, it's one of those things where it's nice to have. I think Angry Fist is a little more shareable between the two. It's kind of pick one, and obviously if you're playing a force, for example, uh, you need to be able to equip it, and sadly the god hand falls out of that category. So you only have one choice in that option. Let me move where this is. Sacred Duster is technically better, but that's a harder farm. At least I think it is. Let's check, chat. Is it better? Yes. Sacred Duster's more annoying to pick up, though, so do it. Do with it as you will, your many options versus full up. Kind of has like 38 TP behind Sacred Duster, I think, yeah. It's just a little bit outclass. It's not like the worst outclassing of all time, but worth mentioning. Let me put this little, little thing here. Look at that, chat. See, this is why we do the stream live, because there's items I'll, I'll remember that they exist, but forget to put them on the list. And just like I like Red Sword higher on the list. We're just kind of correcting as we go. There we go. Nice little description there. So up next we have Holy Ray. Holy Ray is kind of an interesting thing. It's one of those ones where, like, hunters can technically use it. And it's one of the ways you could get a 210 distance weapon on a hunter. However, I'm going to draw attention to this. In fact, I'm going to make a note here. However, it requires 680 MST to use. So, it is something that potentially a force could pick up if they want a damage option. 70 accuracy is phenomenal. So potentially on something like the Faux Newman or Fomar, it's an okay ranged option if you're trying to snipe the boss, for example. There's better weapons down the line, but how many of them can you say only have an MST requirement? Not many. It also gives the Arrest Special, which... 
if this rolls with any hit percentage, is actually pretty useful throughout the game. As I said before, the accuracy is really good, and having a 210 range 70 minimum hit accuracy weapon is pretty silly. So you don't even need it to be even crazy crazy high. But if I find it around 30 hit, I think that's about where my cutoff is. Maybe 25? I guess I'll take Helcleve's opinion. What exact hit would I take this over, like the equivalency over the other snipers? I mean, for Hunter, it's it's a no-brainer. They don't have a sniper of that kind of range. Romarl has somewhat better choices. You have to be a little more careful and a little more, I would say, scrutinous of the options. I guess we could briefly compare it to the regular ray gun. So that base is 70. So a 50 hit ray gun would be 85. Maybe only 15 then. I'll lower it a little bit. You can also compare it against Sniper. Let me hit. Okay, so, so I was right. It was about 30 hit for that. But a 15 hit only for the ray gun. So I guess it just depends on what class you are. I'm glad we did that math real quick. But yeah, it's an item that, like, technically the Humar can wield it, but, like... Sorry, Chad. Humar dumb. His MST growth, he's never getting it. <laughs> he's, he's, like, level 170. He's like, wait, maybe I can use it now. Poor Humar. He has something good. He just, he just can't meet the requirements. It's so sad. Maybe one day he'll be free, chat. Maybe one day. But hey, uh, it's a good alternative for 30 hit snipers. But if you're just looking to have something better than like an arrest uh, ray gun, which it's pretty easy to get 30 hit ray guns uh, in very hard mode with Restless Lion. Getting a 50 hit ray gun is a little tougher. But even then, only needing 15 hit is the bare minimum hit you could roll on Holy Ray. And it just gives you more damage, more range. So just be aware that you can, in theory, get this on very hard mode. I don't think I mentioned this. And be... I think it's actually not a ban hunt on green ID, honestly. Dwarf on a clear green ID is not bad. Otherwise, we have uh, green, pink, and yellow for d -Role. Which again, it's like if you're doing boss rush quests, it's somewhat common to come across. Not too bad. So up next, we'll, tack up, we'll talk about Magical Stone or Artista. But I'm going to show the final completed weapon of Rainbow Baton. The Magical Stone or Artista is a component. If you combine it with a slicer, you can turn into Rainbow Baton. The reason why Rainbow Baton is really good, it has slightly more range than normal slicers. But more importantly, if you find a very high hit slicer, please don't do this to anything less than 50 hit. In fact, don't even use it on 50 hit. You save it for like 55 hit and above. You can basically customize this, and you can turn all of your junk slicers into an actually really solid, confuse causing slicer. And for characters like Hucast in particular, or even Humar to some extent, that care more about accuracy than raw weapon damage, which to be fair, this also has pretty good weapon damage for a slicer. Um, this is a pretty good alternative, so you can hit those shots. Granted, it's not as powerful as the 13 Discovery Man we mentioned earlier, but sometimes all you need is accuracy chat. And granted, Rainbow Baton cheats a little with 13, but until you get to that point, this weapon is definitely stronger. It sadly can only be found in Forest and Temple by fighting Hildetors or the rare Hildebears by Red ID, but it is a fun fight, slash grind. Then we have a very, very situational. So we went to sort of situational. Like, Holy Ray can be good in some scenarios, depending on hit. To truly 100% situational. It's weird that it's called a bazooka, but it doesn't have the bazooka animation. So instead, it's pretty much like a, a pistol range attack, but it uses the shotgun animation, which means it's pretty bad on most characters, except for Fomarl. So if for whatever reason you are playing through hard to ultimate, 
you might have probably come across this item, so I'm just going to mention it one more time here. It's not like a I should hunt it actively item, but if it happens to roll with hit and you're playing Fomaro, I would take it. But sadly, at the same places you can hunt for some of these, it's just so much easier just to go to temple instead and do these things. Also, I don't know why I put Dubchick in there. It's not correct. I'll fix the formatting later. That will bother me later. But sadly, with the screen this size, I can't see my other options. Let's see if they're normal. That's unfortunate. Downside to uh, making sure it's visible by the chat. I'll do something like this so I'll find it later. I'll make a note. But I think overall, it's it's just okay. It is just literally there for the Fomaral to maybe kill something? Maybe... But it's just, it's just got otherwise very mediocre stats. Here's an item that I actually kind of slept on for a long time. I don't know why I didn't try to use this before. I don't think I used this until like my fourth or fifth character. And even that, I'm not sure how much of that was on stream. But Demolition Comet. Demolition Comet is a surprisingly strong weapon. Uh, it's not the best double saber that potentially can be grabbed, so that's why it's more in the situational end. It does, however, have unreduced devils, which is okay because of the fact that you could rapidly apply it. So potentially if you end up with uh, something with hit percentage, it might be used. Personally, I just prefer Gear Soul for the utility, which is a weapon we'll talk about a little later. Vivian, which is just a stronger version for females, uh, but it, it gets rid of the semi-useful special uh, for TP Drain. And Black King Bar, which is just massive, massive ATP. I think it's fine. If for people looking for something else, they're looking for another weapon to climb, I think it's worth getting. Welcome, Charlie. Hope you're doing well. It's just, it's just a solid option. Let's talk about some very situational uses. We have Sacred Claw. See that? We even got a little bit of the visual at the bottom. So Sacred Claw basically just grants you immunity to paralysis. That's the only reason why it's worn. It's got a little bit of EDK. It's meant to make certain runs less annoying, so if you're fighting a lot of Cave Lilies or Indie Belras, um, you'll wear this, I guess, to free up a slot. So technically, the way you could view it this way is if you're a human character, you can have an armor that frees up a slot, so instead of Cure Paralysis, you can put Resist Devil. So it ends up being like a 30 EDK armor choice with your shield, which is not bad. Or late game, it's just a free slot for whatever you want. I don't super recommend it over the other options. It also has a pretty steep level requirement of 144, but it's also kind of easy to pick up and just hold on to it. So honestly, your call whether or not you want to use it, and that's why I put it under situational. Sadly, there's also uh, God Armor and God Ability, which are they're okay, but there's it's it's better to go for the Heavenly Arms, which is farmable by many IDs early on, like for example the red ID uh, for things like battle units and stuff like that, and Heavenly Arms also has some decent grinding areas. However, the alternative is just getting some God Arms from Corrin's Gamble. I don't super recommend this. This is only to help you then get the Heavenly Arms, otherwise you're going to replace every God Arm with the Heavenly Arms. So if you had a choice, if you're an ID that very easily gets it in Forest from the Wolves, for example, do that grind. Don't don't bother hunting or getting god arms. Getting one is kind of like a happy little accident, or maybe you got it in prior difficulties, but it's not recommended you spend a lot of time there. Uh, similarly, you can hunt for god ability, and it can be found in temple, which is okay in spaceship. And it it's okay, but normally you're going to probably fill up your other units with things like smart link first. And by the time you're done, like, your final set of equipment might be, like, Heavenly Battle or V101, A God Ability or Heavenly Ability or Centurion Ability, which are just all upgrades over God Ability, which are also not super hard to get. Um, and it's just okay. It gives a little bit of ATA, so there are some situations where you could free up a Heavenly Arms a couple levels or even four levels early, depending on which ability you put on, which is useful. If you're looking to kind of 
level multiple characters and straddle them a little less. So this is just kind of what I call a filler unit. Otherwise, like, it does slightly raise your luck total, which is useful for just making sure you get as much damage as you can. But it's something that will be not prioritized over accuracy or even smart link at all. So it's kind of like a mid-game item option you could get in early game. But arguably by the time you're in mid-game, you'll find better. So if you have it, great. If not, not a big deal. Okay. So I think we have now officially covered all of the beginning area stuff. So you now have some decent weapons, handguns, potentially sh shotgunists or shot gun style weapons, some basic clears, some slicers, all those things will let you ascend. So we're gonna remind people in this part about photon crystals. Photon crystals are basically the, I'll call it the consolation prize of running anything in episode four. So before we talk about that, we're gonna briefly showcase it again. So I'm gonna go hide the tall window, show this so chat sees the other one. It'll figure out which one I mean in a moment. There we go, it, it thought about it. So essentially these are items that you can use to add hit percentage to your weapons. Uh, I recommend checking out the popper guide where it goes over the different uh, black paper deal slash dangerous deal with black paper quests, depending on the translation, uh, that you could use it there. So if I ever mention the monster parts again, reminder, these are super easy drops. You will find them basically on every ID, either on satellite lizards or yaoi's. That's all I'm looking to add here. This is just another reminder. It's really solid. It's something you'll be using for pretty much the whole game. So let's go to our first early... No, mid-game. We'll say mid-game. I almost said early game. For, for forces, it is kind of their early game, though, to be fair. So let's go ahead and look up Lamed Argent. So this weapon is kind of unassuming. Requires 800 ATP to use, so it's not something that you can... Even if you got it early, you just can't use it at all. The requirements are too high on most characters. It's usable by everybody but the Phone Roll, so rip Phone Roll. However, if you unlock it, so we're going to keep in mind, 430, 465. That's not bad. It also has a downside of because it's a sealed weapon, it can only have two attributes instead of three. So you usually get hit and something, and that's it. However, when you get the number of kills needed to unlock it, which is 10,000, it upgrades into the fantastically, horribly overpowered Excalibur. What a weapon. This is a game warping weapon. This is like something everybody should hunt, hunt for. Forces, rangers, hunters. This is like your MVP. What, what does this... What does this solve? Basically everything. So where to even begin with it? Same requirement to use, but instead it now has a 900 to 950 attack range. It even gives 35 MST for some reason. Why does it do that? I have no idea. Accuracy 60. That's pretty good. That's above most of the other weapon types that we've seen. And most importantly is that little extra orange plus two in targets. So what that means is that every time you swing, normally Saber can only hit one target, but when you thrust forward or slash, you now hit three targets or three different body parts of a larger monster. So this has now become your number one boss killer. You hold it when you're doing things like full op kills, use it to clear easy grunts. If it comes with accuracy, you can use it on Hunter for constant berserking and you instantly kill basically everything. Let me hide the guy briefly so I could talk about another item. It also pairs with a specific uh, kind of mid-game item, Proof of Sword Saint, which we'll talk about in detail. But essentially, as long as you have Proof of Sword Saint, it's going to give you another 30 accuracy. So that, that accuracy thing I mentioned earlier, if it is accuracy used on a hunter, you can cheat it in with this. So as you become very high level, not mid-game, but like you only need one Heavenly Arms to hit max accuracy kind of endgame, you're going to start replacing your Heavenly Arms instead with Proof of Sword Saint for hunters. So potentially having two of those, and Heavenly Arms, and a battle unit, means you're getting over 60 accuracy. Imagine having 60 extra accuracy on your main swing weapon, and the Berserk, with its raw damage, is so high that you kill basically everything in the game. There is basically 
very few situations where if you were in range, this is not the right option to go to. It does everything. It does minor crowd control. It kills bosses. It kills multi-part bosses. It deals with vault up. It, for some reason, raises MST in case you need to learn techniques. I don't know why. Listen, chat, it's there. <laughs> like, did you not learn every tech yet? Might as well just hold it on a hunter, right? Like, I don't know. But yeah, what a fantastic item start to finish. Uh, we mentioned before the dragon scale, so I'm just going to mention it here again. Dragon scale turns into Telusius, which gives a little bit of attack speed, not important. Gives light and dark resistance, which can sometimes be important. More, more dark resist than light resist. As it's just another way to be unkillable in cave quests. So it's just another way of squeezing out more immortality. Light resist is only really useful me maybe against Dorfana Claire and maybe falls offhand. Otherwise, they it doesn't really matter. I guess technically sorcerers too, but whatever. You're you're not usually hurting for it in those scenarios. But anyway, back to the god. So what a fantastic weapon. Downside, it takes a while to unlock. So hey, if you uh, if you want to unlock and slowly feed ult mags for your other characters, or you saw this weapon for the first time and went, oh wait, this is real, then yeah, <laughs> this is the absolute game changer. It's one of the best standard weapons in the game. I would still argue it's one of the best weapons in the game. It it solves so many things for basically every class except for phone roll over phone roll. So, sadly, it's really brutal to get in mines. I honestly think this hunt is very hard unless you have a very dedicated character. I actually really recommend Crater instead, so that's why for the most part you're going to see this in probably an early pickup from Force. Like, Dwarfon is really easy for Force to kill once they get a couple of god HPs. And you'll see me do these more than yellow ID hunts, that's for sure. But anyway, what a fantastic item. Speaking of uh, potentially run defining, we'll go to Daylight Scar. So this option, I'm warming up to it a little bit. I think the thing that makes me a little sad is it doesn't have quite the stack ability with uh, Proof of Sword Saint, which again, we'll talk in more detail on how to unlock it, um, as something like Excalibur. But it is an option for people playing classic mode. Double hitting with daggers he is pretty strong with Hugh Seal in particular, and her high accuracy kind of makes up for the fact that uh, it's a little harder to get with hit percentage. You have to fight some pretty bad enemies to get it. Like, there's there's usually either not a lot of brands or not or you need ridiculous accuracy to hunt Del Sabers. And honestly, I've probably gotten almost as many Daylight Scars from Kondryu, which is an underground hunt for Bloods Rush, than I have from Baran's on Yellow ID. So take that as you will, but I'm also not a big believer in Spaceship, to be honest. It's, it's okay. The hunts. The hunts are okay, I mean. The daggers, however, are usable by Ranger, which is kind of nice. So if you're looking for that last little tap to insta-kill something in Tower, uh, or you're trying to get through the ridiculous damage or defense of like a pan arms or something like that, this weapon will go up a bit more in priority. Otherwise, I don't really use this for normal clear because daggers are very short range, so they're always going to be outperformed by mech guns in most scenarios. Up next, we have yet another potential game changing rare. So, this one is an alternative to Excalibur. So, we mentioned before. If you if you zap with Gazond on Vault Op, it'll check your ATP instead of the damage of the technique being used. So this one is strictly a more powerful version of Excalibur if you're looking to do Vault Op runs, but it also has Spirit, and it also just has more damage. So honestly, if all you're looking to do is the single target portion of being able to burst something, Galatine can really beat Excalibur in that by quite a bit. Uh, 77 accuracy is ridiculous. I don't know why this weapon is beyond sniper and accuracy. Just put a lot of question marks in the chat. Like, I, this has more accuracy than Holy Ray chat. I don't know why. <laughs> Just, it does. So it's not, it's not useless with zero hit due to that reason. It's sad that the Hugh Seal can't take advantage of it for spirit. <laughs> There's the question marks. I, it's just really accurate for some reason. 
Um, and it also benefits, we'll hide the guide briefly, it also benefits from uh, Galatine itself, which is kind of nice, or Proof of Sword Saint itself. So again, just one Proof of Sword Saint and its ridiculous sniper-like accuracy means it's probably about the same as having a 50 hit uh, sniper of the same ability. So it is, it is very surprisingly good. Still upset you didn't get the banner for 30 hit, I'm so sorry, Dango. But at least you could say you have a really good weapon. I mean, as I said before, this this is really, really good on, on um, most of the characters. And honestly, with its high accuracy, I kind of like it a little more on like Fomar and Fomarl. With like very little bonus accuracy. With Hunters, I don't even think it's needed because the Proof of Sword Saint exists, to be honest with you. I think they would rather enjoy having enemy percentages on the 990 plus 9 grind so they could just go to like Looney Tunes level the damage. <laughs> so take take it as you will. It is funny rangers can also use it. So it's just fantastic. The downside though is as I said before, unless you're going after a very specific target, like you're looking to kill a single ill gill, or you're looking to get through I don't know, like a Darkbringer by itself, or you're looking to kill Indy Belra instantly. It, Excalibur will be useful in more scenarios just due to its pierce. But don't sleep on this weapon. This weapon is really, really good. Hopefully I'll use it more on stream going forward. Also, in Affinia, they removed the even beat claw or they removed the beat timer clause. Originally, this weapon essentially gained power over time. So only from like the beats of 500 to 624 did it have the stats it has permanently now. Otherwise, the times we normally played, it had less than Excalibur. So I never had a reason to play it on stream. And that's why I also ended up getting rid of them. In fact, it could get as low as 110 to 140. So it could be quite horrendous. So be aware if you're playing on something other than Affinia that that is a problem with that item. Uh, I'm missing a hunt here. Should also be yellow boss. There we go. That one I had no reason to exclude. So anyway, now let's talk about Gear Soul. Gear Soul is also another fantastic item. So it is a little weaker than something like Demolition Comet, technically. The reason people use it though, and the why this is important to pick up at some point, one, the hunts are really not that bad. Uh, Yowie's drop it on blue ID, which is pretty good. Pazuzu Sky Yellow Ball is not too bad. The real reason you get this is because, one, you could get an all zero one very early by turning in uh, Massive Attack 4 tickets, a quest called To the Deepest Blue. Two, it drains your health. So if you're trying to set up uh, specific invincibility triggers or trying to abuse the weapon Dark Flow, which is a weapon that requires you to be at a certain percentage in order to use it special, it's really good at manipulating hit points. So it is a decent weapon. It's not the best possible double saber that you can get. It's still really strong on Fomar and Fonuman, but it is really, really good at hit point manipulation. I think it's special can also pierce walls and hit things it's not supposed to. So I believe this could also be used against Dubwitch. Chat can correct me if I'm wrong. I almost never use it for that because I have other options, but I think that is true. But I'm gonna leave on. I'm gonna leave it to chat to fact check me on that. It's not something I see referenced anywhere. I know it'll go through walls because I've seen it go through walls before. I'm just not sure if it hits Dub Witch specifically. But anyway, you can use it for the. You can use it for the projectiles. They're not really worth damage. They're not worth the damage usage for it. Accuracy of 50 is pretty much middle of the road, which is fine. But more importantly, it's kind of a flex item. It's one of the only weapons you could say it's a solid single target focus weapon that all classes can use. So this is something you'll potentially pick up as force for your other characters and vice versa. So let's talk about some of the female only options. So up next we have Terrell's Parasol. Let me just show briefly. So this thing is ridiculously, ridiculously good. It all zeroed gives you the ability to have boosted shift of D-Band and rest of range, which is fantastic for support. So already it's a situational item no matter what its stats are. 
If we look at the rest of the stat line of it, it is a little bit below average accuracy, I guess. Or 40 might be dead average, actually. And the attack power 250 to 300 isn't too impressive. However, it is a charge weapon, and it can be used by other characters. So it's hard to find it roll high, but I feel like on characters like Hunural and Hukasil, it having a charge special means that you just have another alternative to charge Partisan. I would say that unless you are... Unless you are the Rangers, you probably want it with a little bit of hit percentage, but you need it with a lot of hit percentage for the Force. So while the Faux Marl and Faux Neural can technically use it, it's kind of brutal to use without at least like 35-40 hit. Because otherwise you can't even use the charge special, which is like the entire point of using the weapon. Or at least like the Huka Seal has super good accuracy, so she can basically have a mid-hit Terrell's Parasol and be fine kind of things. Where like Ra Marl and Rocka Seal don't really need hit percentage for it to be useful and also use it for utility purposes. That's kind of a nice support item that also does damage. Um, it becomes better with hit percentage, of course. And surprisingly, it's farmable in a whole bunch of different areas, so not too bad on very hard in case you're looking for alternatives, but otherwise it's kind of found in more, we'll say less player-friendly runs of uh, Jungle Mountain, Seaside, and CCA, which I do think Pink has some good overall hunts in those locations, don't get me wrong but a little brutal. Oh, I forgot to also mention for uh, Lame to Arjun, um, a lot of people will be running uh, Episode 4 Dorfon, for example, as forces, but if you have a Hell Weapon, there's a lot of runs you could do quickly in Jungle Seaside and CCA, I believe it's Phantasmal World 2 specifically offhand, uh, that will result in you getting a ton of clears here. So I think maybe towards the end, we'll take a look at some of the enemy counts for quests. I wasn't sure how much chat wanted me to go into that in particular. I wanted to talk about more what IDs have them and where to hunt them versus like what quests to specifically hunt them, because that that would take forever. We're already at 60 pages. <laughs> so we'll talk about it. Maybe maybe we'll do a consolation prize at the, at the end. We'll talk about the different hunts. We'll say bonus for the, for the video only. Yeah, uh, otherwise, uh, into the strong weapon choices, we have uh, weapons called Shurin and Gurin, and they form Jizai. Let me go ahead and do a quick look up here. So Shurin by itself is pretty strong. I mean, it's 820 to 870 attack power, so it's almost on par with Excalibur without needing to do any unlocks. However, if you combine it with Gurin, Gurin is slightly weaker, uh, it forms Jizai. So Jizai is a twin sword. Do this a little bit. Like how that's centered. There we go. So it's a twin sword that pretty good. It's it's a little under in terms of Excalibur ATP. However, it also pairs with Proof the Sword Saint, which is another thing that gives 30 accuracy to your weapon. And more importantly, it has the Hell Special. This is a really easy to kind of bump up in accuracy with Proof of Sword Saint. You can grind repeatedly for Gurren's in order to uh, end up with a hit percentage version of the item, and Shurin's can have any stats, since you basically um, transfer the items of only one of them to go to the completed pair of Jizai. Otherwise, it's just a really solid ATP beat stick. It's something to kind of hunt for in the background. Shuren is not really a fun hunt to do, because there's not a lot of really good drops on Verdi and Green and White for caves, sadly. There's some okay ones, but they're not quite as grindable as being able to do something like Spaceship Orange ID, for example, where you could potentially get a really strong Daylight Scar, which is really good, and also get a component for Jizai. That's why people will end up doing a lot of Spaceship runs for those, sadly. Uh, kind of as an alternative to those, if you are struggling to find things, I would say Red Dagger is actually surprisingly decent for Hunter only, if you have Crimson Code. If you don't have Crimson Code, I wouldn't bother. But otherwise, it does roughly the same damage as uh, Daylight Scar, it just doesn't have a good special. So if all you're looking to do is use it in the same situations of finishing off enemies in close range, it's not bad. But yeah, definitely though, definitely not preferred as much as the other ones. But you might find yourself with Crimson Coat, depending on your character choice. 
So up next we have the Yashminikov. So this is a fantastic weapon. ATP wise, it's actually decent for mech guns. Mech guns usually have like less than 30 after grinders, so the fact that this has potentially the 50 to 90 range is solid enough. It doesn't have any specials, but the reason people use it is the range. It is a sniper's range attack on a machine gun. What an absolutely ridiculous thing. It also is a set bonus with Gratia for hit percentage for some reason. In case you're not using Ranger Wall, but you should be using Ranger Wall. Sorry, Chad. That's just one of those things. You should just absolutely be using Ranger Wall instead. It's technically there. Yeah, this is just fantastic full, full screen clearing. Really got nothing much else to say for it. It's just really, really fantastic. It's a nice, uh, it's a nice alternative for uh, hitting falls in particular, where she might go out of range, depending on what attack is being used. So if you're like in the middle of the arena, because the boss did the, uh, the old "I'm on this side, no, I'm on that side" trick against you, having that option to be able to burst them is good. And also on the final phase, instead of running forward and attacking with mech guns, you get more overall attacks by standing still with Yashminikov. So that might result in more damage, in particular if you're not used to landing uh, a double string of attacks. Thought I mentioned those cases specifically. Up next we have the I can't believe this gun exists game changing item. This is the boss killer uh, for any boss with multi parts for the ranger. It is the cannon rouge. It, it, it hits up to 10 targets, or if you think about it from a worm boss perspective, it hits 10 plates. It has ridiculously high ATP. It scales fantastically with enemy percentages. And most of the time, you're never going to be using it special. So all you need to do is have enough accuracy to land a heart attack, which as a Ramar at max ATA, that requires you to have zero additional accuracy to always land it in single player. So adjust accordingly. Somewhere between 5 and 25 hit will probably fix the character. But wow, wow, oh wow. There's so many different ways you could use this item. I don't even know where to begin. It can hit, uh, it can hit switches through walls. It destroys bosses. It can multi-hit lilies and kill them instantly, which is hilarious in single player. Um, you could use it to fire against the wall and hit things you're not supposed to be able to hit. You could use it to shoot enemies that are overhead. You could shoot them when they're on the ground. It's really good at hitting dragon, for example, in the air, any of the dragon bosses. The only thing it's not good about is repeated damage. But man, oh man, it just it just solves kind of everything, to be honest with you. I love trap shooting with this weapon because it's funny. <laughs> not because it's not because it's good to do, but it, it feels like you send a message whenever you trap shoot with its ridiculous explosion radius to set off your traps. <laughs> send the message, chat, send the message. Okay. So we're going to go straight from the monster part into the next one. So let's talk about special items and support items. These are the, these are things that are really good to use in conjunction with ATP. So we have a bringer's rifle, which again, I would just like to state is less accurate than Galatine. Um, <laughs> that gives demons, which is the best uh, HP loss thing you could get. Most importantly, it's usable by forces. This is pretty much your go-to item for forces. Um, if you're looking to do hard areas, you get Photon Crystals playing Episode 4, and that allows you to get up to a 50-hit Sniper with guaranteed demons that's unreduced and usable by Rangers and also forces. So just basically start to finish, it is just really, 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 really solid, and you will see a lot of end game players running around with this item. Now granted, technically you could find common snipers that have demons that are higher hit percentage, but those are extraordinarily rare and are extraordinarily expensive if we're talking about potentially purchasing them. Up next we have one of my favorite items in the game, and no it's not Frozen Shooter. It's Slicer Fanatic. So it has a slightly extended slice slicer radius compared to normal slicer, but it hits one less target. And you're like, okay, that doesn't sound super great, because you get us positioned a little closer. But it is demons, unreduced demons. So this means against Gerdabulu specifically by doing the special normal glitch, or the SN glitch. 
Uh, you could basically just delete Gurdabulu from existence. It is This is like my go-to weapon for episode 4. And fantastically, it drops from enemies in episode 4. It's like they want you to destroy episode 4 with its own items. But yeah, it's, it's good in basically all scenarios. Potentially even better than Bringer's Rifle, especially if you don't have max hit on Bringer's Rifle. Just due to the fact that you can SN glitch this and... The fact that you're using normal accuracy, which is like getting like hundreds of extra ATA, is pretty crazy. And the fact that it can hit a group is pretty crazy. And the fact that it has still decent ATP is pretty crazy. So you could kill basically everything in episode 2 with it to an extent, as like the Fomarl, who loves slicers by the way. She's very good with slicers for people that were not aware. It is pretty much her go-to slicer outside of Disco Brayman. What a ridiculous item. Please get this item. Like, ASAP. If you're able to do anything with, uh, Crater to get the Satellite Lizards on RN, or if you could go underground with it, ooh, so good. So up next, we have S-Red Arms, which I've noticed I don't have the things so that we hunt for it. So we'll go fix that in real time. Oh, this is the one that tilts me. Okay, chat, we're gonna have a little aside. So... It can't detect S-Red's arms, but it can detect S-Red's blades. Do you want to know why, chat? I will find it eventually. There we go. The reason being... is that it's lowercased. That drives me wild. <laughs> chat, please petition on my behalf to correct this. This drives me wild. I don't know why. I, I'm glad I didn't want to mention it to them on Discord before we stream this. I want to prove. I can't search S Red Arms unless I go here. Because if you search it up, it doesn't recognize it because the letters are different letter capitalizations. It drives me wild, chat. I can never find this thing when I look for it. I feel so sad. In fact, let me try it one more time. Let me see if it also finds the other one. Okay, so it does find it lowercase, but this is uppercase. Question. Oh, no, no, no. It's it, okay. It's working there. It's working there. Disregard. The redirect works. The redirect works. But yeah, I'm not sure why they're different capitalizations. Is it like that in the game chat? Did they, did they randomly lowercase that? Sorry, tangent. Just one of those things. It just bothers me. I don't know why it's like that. Give me one second, chat, as we correct where we find this. So these are only findable in Sinnoh Red, which makes it simple. So basically, from our standpoint, um, sadly, there's only a couple IDs that can find it, like Sky ID, Yellow Boss, and White Ill. The reason why this weapon is good, tangent aside, is the fact that it is the only real way in order for your cast to get a low-level version of Shifted D-Band. Now, you could, in theory, upgrade this with Photon Crystals for accuracy. You could, in theory, Spear it. I don't recommend it. Its stats are very mediocre. It's mostly just intended to get this bonus of shift in D-Band. It actually has a surprisingly, shockingly high ATP. Like, chat, did, did you realize, like, I didn't realize, why is S-Red Blade's minimum requirement higher than Excalibur? <laughs> Am I allowed to ask that question, chat? I feel like that's fair. Why is that requirement so high? I don't think it's that good. Oh, that's true. Also for the humor. <laughs> Sorry, chat, forgot about the humor briefly. Or Humor, rip Humor. Anyway, I don't I don't know why it's 821 ATP. That that's always been weird to me. I remember that, because I was like, why can I wield Excalibur as you cast, but not this? And I was like, oh. Yeah, you'll never use this for damage, you're gonna use it for its specials. <laughs> Poor Dango, the Humor representative of the chat. He's taking all the abuse right now. Uh but yeah, it's it's good to do when you have downtime, like you're waiting for a boss to be within range, or you're waiting for like the moth nest to land. You might as well as do it. It's something for casts to do while they're waiting. And otherwise, it's okay. It, it's okay. You generally won't use this in multiplayer play because most people should have it there. Why even 821 specifically? I, I have no idea. <laughs> it's just one of those things. I would learn to fight back, but it doesn't reach more than three inches from me. Ooh, you more self burn. But yeah, this is just a, it's a solid buff utility item. So people will use it in their clears, even in tower. 
So it's not just like, oh, I'm only going to use it on like bosses or whatever. Like it does have use constantly throughout. Whenever you can slip it in, it's really great. We're coming up to my favorite item in the game, Unai. I would like to just point, hold on chat. I would like to point this out. It has like no description for Kunai. Kunai is unloved. Rip Kunai. <laughs> anyway, back back to the description of Kunai. <laughs> so, what does Kunai do? It doesn't state it in the wiki, but it does what cards do. So if you attack once, attack twice, it's single hit, single hit, but then the third attack shoots three times. So this is a ATP requirement item, not very high, 412 is pretty low. That potentially has three chances of arrest at a single target. Or, if enemies are really close to each other, it can arrest more than one target. So this is just really fantastic crowd control. If you don't have anything that buffs your paralysis chance, it kind of locks it in as guaranteed. Also, it's another weapon that absolutely devastates Gurdabulu. And surprise, surprise, you find it in episode 4. So, it doesn't do a lot of damage. The other thing that it does that isn't listed anywhere is that it'll go through walls to hit dub switches in Spaceship. So even if you don't use it for Paralysis, which is already really great for support, it's really good for Mines and Spaceship for hitting those dub witches uh, before you're able to do so. And it's one of the very few options that Hunters have in order to do it. Like, Forces and Rangers have some decent options. Hunters are like... They're, they're, they're hoping for gold, glory or something. <laughs> they can't exactly just bazooka the wall as much as they want to. So yeah. It can also hit bosses when they're high up in the sky, so if you truly have nothing else to do, you could kunai them, but it's not going to do a lot of damage. But if you ever miss a boss by like 300 health, which does happen as you climb, you would be surprised at you, how, many, how many kills you can clinch out with the kunai, because it usually ignores any evasion the enemy has in the air. Which is not true with things like handgun. But anyway. All hail Kunai chat. Kunai Slicer Fanatic are my dream weapons for sure. So up next we have a weaker Monkey King bar. Uh, the reason it's used is that for Rangers, it's one of the only double sabers they can use, which is kind of nice. Unless they're female, then they Vivian, of course. But it also has Devils. So on a high accuracy Ranger, they could just Devils a target into the ground, essentially. It's not bad, it's more situational, but it's just another way to get a devil on it. So something you'll probably get more from running Ruin's Green ID, is Ruin's has a lot of great things for Green ID, including things like Heavenly Arms, that you'll probably be going for, and you might pick this up on the way there, so I figured it'd be worth mentioning. Also, I love that this weapon requires uh, level, eight, or level 100 Hunter and 800 ATP to upgrade into the Black King Bar with the Blue Black Stone. But the weapon requirement is only 500 ATP. I feel like Red Dagger should have been 500, given that this is stronger than the Red Daggers. <laughs> so, I don't know, chat. Rip Red Daggers. So up next, we have Sun Summit Moon, so I'll just briefly showcase what that weapon looks like. If you're playing Faux New World, I would consider this more core, since it buffs uh, simple techniques of Foe, Zond, and Barda by 30% damage. Otherwise, it's only really used for sometimes against falls. So that way you don't have to carry a million canes. But sadly, Club Laconium for the final phase in particular is just better because it gives a 40% bonus to Foey. So you can hunt for the Magic Rock Mula from many other things. It's okay. It's not something I would go crazy for. It's just a nice thing to reduce how many things you're holding. Okay. So we mentioned it a couple times. It's time to talk about... 13. So 13, usable by all characters. Level requirement is 101, so that's pretty early game when it comes to ultimate, but not something you can use right away. The fact that it buffs weapon damage by 50% and accuracy 30 is why people use this. It's what makes Disco Brave Man basically meta all the way through. It can also be found on uh, Viridian, Sky, Purple, Red, and Yellow uh, for all box runs. I think I'll, I'll mention that, actually. Oh, no, no, I already did. My bad. I'm blind. So, yeah, this is just kind of something you'll literally accidentally get while playing Episode 4. Otherwise, uh, you'll end up getting it maybe playing White ID and the other locations. 
But yeah, episode 4 is just literally just open boxes, get best armor in the game, question mark. Its defenses are very average for rare armor. It's nothing too exceptional. Resistances are mostly bad, because only twos and stuff is not that great, sadly. We want to talk about resistances. We'll go to the next armor on the list, which is the Crimson Coat. So for example, if you just wanted generic resistances and decent defense, and it's the same level requirement, Crimson Coat is your friend. Before you get any real endgame items, let's close this so you can see what I'm looking at. It also pairs with the Red Saber, which we talked about earlier, Red Dagger and Red Slicer. I don't think Red Slicer is worth going for most of the time. I'll very briefly showcase that it's usable by all characters. It's okay. You'll end up getting this in either caves or uh, ruins, but I don't think it's worth hunting for it explicitly. Just be aware that if you happen to pick it up, it's decent, but it's not going to be stronger than Brave Man or even Rainbow Baton by itself, sadly. So yeah, this just gives really solid resist, but it is like the phone roll one. All characters except one, yeah, something like that. Up next, we have a very important resistance armor in Brightness Circle. Let's go back to the guide. So it's not recommended that you actually combine in order to create this for the most part. So like in theory, you could take a Spirit Garment from Very Hard Mode and Star Amplifier from Ultimate in order to create this item. However, because of the fact that it can only roll with a total of 7 defense bonus and 5 bonus evade, if you just get it randomly dropped, I mean you're missing potentially 40-50 defense if you look at the defense range on this. So if you're gonna pick up an armor that gives 25 EDK, which again is really great for females versus lilies, and overall really strong defense for surviving things like Sinnohs, then that's what you'll probably go for. So worth the hunt in probably the mid game. It's it's okay on males, it can be used on males, but males have better EDK options. Most notably, Dressplate is like the end-all be-all item. Also, Dressplate, if you're near somebody of the opposite gender, it will have those little heart icons. Normally, they don't pop up like you see there. But essentially, this is an armor that is terrible in evasion, gives no resistances other than dark, and it gives very minor evasion. So normally a junk, total bad item, 70 dark resistance. It makes you immune to basically every, every insta-kill in the game that it can be resisted. So all you would need is basically a shield granting about 15 and then one resist devil, and you ignore everything except for essentially murder flower. It's kind of insane. So people will use this regardless of uh, area just because being able to just be immune to just random Megid is good. So people will end up using this even though it doesn't have ATP boost like some of the other options. We'll talk about one that's good for single player but maybe not as great in multiplayer. We have the Blackhound Caress. So this item gives really big penalties to evasion so rip using dolphin for damage. It gives insane defense though. 330 is really, really, really high. Um, and it can be used by only casts. The reason why this is potentially preferred is that in single player, you don't have the ability to debuff the enemies most of the time. But wearing something like this and Gratia, which is an item we'll talk about. Actually, we'll talk about it now since I just mentioned it. Combining it with this and Gratia means that you basically have 500 plus defense and take no damage. Gracia is a fantastic S only item. Not so much for rangers because they prefer to have uh, bonuses for uh, ranger wall instead, but for survival. So if you pair, for example, a dress plate, which we saw earlier, which gives 70 EDK with Gracia, you have 94 dark resistance for casts. You're basically immune to them, and it's basically like teehee funny. Like, you will basically never die to, to insta kill. This also has some set bonuses with the Reanovs. It nerfs the Reanovs for some reason, so you get 20 less accuracy with that Reanov 303 SNR 5 we saw earlier. And it gives bonuses to accuracy for Yashminikovs, but uh, spoilers, hunters can't use them. So even though this is a really solid armor for them for uh, defensive purposes, can't really take advantage of the set bonuses, sadly. 
that is definitely very disappointing. Alternatively, for hunters only, and this is what I consider absolutely mandatory for Hyuka Seal, something called Blue Adoshi Violet Nimadao. So, it has moderate defense, solid evade, mediocre resist. It has some, it's better than nothing, but it's not fantastic. The reason people use this armor is because it has a built-in 40% attack speed bonus. In addition, let me hide the guide briefly. If you're playing with certain ubers, which we'll cover towards the end of the guide, getting another 100 weapon attack power and 10 accuracy is a pretty solid bonus, to be honest. So it's, it's not a bad set bonus for ubers. But just be aware that people will use the D parts, which we mentioned earlier, or 13, because Disco Brain Man is just so overwhelmingly powerful. But for Hugh New World, who is like starved for units because she's like 50, 50 to 70 accuracy under her cap, basically at all times, it's pretty much a given that you need to go for this. So where do we hunt this? In Crater, we hunt this um, from Dwarf on Eclair. And that comes from the Sky ID, as well as Auron. And then if we were to go underground... I'm gonna do this. You could get it from Gerdabulu. From Sky as well. So they definitely intended you to have like a very easy way to farm it on Sky ID, which is okay. I think for the most part, it's considered endgame for Hunoral, maybe not so much for the other characters, because they might get more use out of 13. But again, that's all player preference. Do with that as you will. So here's one of the many combat mirrors. So we have one that's more generic, although usually this is not used by rangers. I thought I'd just mention it here. So we don't really care about anything other than 35 attack power, to be honest. Anything that buffs fire, uh, attack power here is huge. It also is the added bonus of uh, giving 30% to Foei, which means that this is weirdly good on Hugh New World because of the fact that most of the time against Falls, when Falls has the rainbow shield up, you'll be using Foei as your damage source. So this can be best in slot for Hugh New World, basically leading up to the actual endgame shields. I figured this one was worth mentioning. Do note though, defense is terrible, evade is fantastic, and the, the existing resists are actually pretty good, it's just a shame it doesn't have dark resist. Now comparatively, so keep in mind this is a level 120 to use barrier, there's also a hunter only version, which again, most of the time, hunters would only be using these. So in exchange for way higher defense, slightly better evade, you lose light resist but get really strong elemental resist to survive episode 1, you get another 35 barrier. Now, the problem with this one is it's it doesn't have any boost to Foey, but if you don't have Foey, like let's say you're a Hue cast or whatever, then it doesn't really doesn't really matter if you don't have the Foey bonus. So think about this if you're looking for a more offensive option. I liked this on Hue Seal for a while before I got uh, a certain Uber from very hard mode, the S parts. It's just another option to hunt for. And again, these are the things where you might pick it up in caves, potentially really early. You might get it uh, later on. Honestly, I could probably bump the other one's position a little bit. Because Yana Mir, you basically can't get unless you're in the other area. But technically... Yeah, let's, let's bump this one up, actually. Keep it more consistent with our set. So originally I thought of them together, but I think realistically with our full kit, if we're putting caves here, it should be here. Oh, that's under optional. That's not situational, it's actually really good. Put it right... For only... yeah, here we go. Put it right in here. Nice and simple chat. So, 
We're making progress. <laughs> we're, we've gotten through a lot of the support items, at least. Anyway, we're now down in V101. So this is considered one of the best, if not the best unit in the game. So I'm going to pop this up because there are so many stats that it gives, it just helps to see this. So, reminder, units are generally usable by everybody with very few exceptions. And it gives 15 to everything and 1.5 accuracy. And, and it gives 40% attack power. So it's just a strict upgrade over Heavenly uh, Battle. And unfortunately, it needs some kind of bad hunts. No one likes going to the mines. But hey, if you're playing Green ID and you're fighting zoos, you're like, heck yeah. I love Green ID episode 4 hunts for V101. Yeah, you'll probably end up fighting a lot of these uh, playing through TTF. I think this is probably the most asked one. Welcome, Protomus. Hope you're doing well. This is probably the most asked one for how to farm it. The answer is TTF. Viridian, Green ID, Aran. To do TTF up to that point. Very silly. Speaking of very silly... We have another unit that is, I would say, core for forces, but not core on the other characters. Two people got them in my TTF runs last night on Green Hill. Nice. So these are... Your birthday today? Happy birthday. These are units that give 100 HP, so it's so it's definitely better than God HP. God HP is still good. Like, two God HPs are fine. But two Heavenly HPs, whew. You are surviving basically everything in the game. This enables a lot of um, power leveling of characters, so you can survive set damage, since set damage and lower difficulty should be under 400. The fact that you could straight up add 200 from two heavenly HPs is really funny. So if you're a force, this is really high priority. If you're low HP ranger, maybe you'll pick it up. Hunters generally will not take this unless they are super, super, super under leveled, because they would prefer to have accuracy. So just be aware, it just depends on what class you are, how critical it is, or how low level you are. Okay. So let's talk about Swordsman lore slash Group of Swords Sand. So I'm gonna do, do a little arrow to keep it consistent with how I did it earlier. So this is the sealed item I kept mentioning over and over and over again. This thing is absolutely silly, stupid, broken. So only usable by hunters. Let's go ahead and pop up the list, because I'm sure chat has questions as to what it's used on. So here's the full list of items in which you could use it. Sadly, it's not every combination of sword, katana, etc. It's only this list. I would say the notable ones from the list are Excalibur, Galatine, maybe Lavis Cannon, depending on what you're playing. Red Saber is usually not important. If you're really into Ubers, two Kamui and Saga and Yasha are pretty good. It's also surprisingly good with Musashi, which I don't think we covered in detail. So I'm going to briefly go back to this. This is a weapon that you can get basically anywhere on hard difficulty. In fact, I'm going to double check, did I mention Musashi? One second. I did. I think I missed... Oh, it's, it's further down the list. That makes sense. We haven't gotten to it yet. So Musashi is basically really situational. Unless this rolls with really high hit percentage, it's not great. But in theory, you might have it from playing hard mode. In theory, you might get it from Orange ID Ruins or Spaceship Green. I don't think you would normally run it those areas on those IDs normally. But in theory, you could get it in Ultimate Mode. Oh well. Yeah, that 30 accuracy makes a big difference, because being able to Berserk repeatedly is super strong. So it has the potential to outdamage things, but it's just sadly not as consistent. But anyway, back to Swordsman lore again. So only a handful of items, most of them katanas, which makes sense. They're just okay. But man oh man, is it super good on Excalibur and Galatine in particular. Okay, let's go back to the list. Let's talk about V501. So this is basically something that gives you a 50% boosted chance of freezing, paralysis, confusion, and insta-kill. Note that this is after it reduces the effectiveness. So for example, if an enemy is 50 EDK and you're boosting your, your odds of it by 50%, it will take the subtraction first. So for whatever reason you go negative, the 50% will not do anything. The chat is aware. 
Unfortunately, it does not work on Migid. If this worked on Migid, I think everything would be fair. Th this is where, like... This is where Hunters and Rangers really start to pull ahead on the Hell game. Because they might have some really good weapon options in order to Hell. Uh, it's nowhere near as ridiculous as it is after they get a V5 unit. So sadly, the benefit that forces have in some areas fall off pretty much the moment you get one of these units. The only difference between this and the V502 for clarity is that instead of a 50% bonus of insta kill, it's a 100% bonus. So basically, if 40% remains after enemy resistance, you have 80% chance of insta kill. So it leads to some very consistent cheesy kills with V502. Which we'll see a little later in the list. That's more of an endgame hunt, sadly, due to where it's located. Up next, in terms of units, we have Vito 1, which is usable by everybody except for casts. So what does it do? It adds 5 MST, whoop de doo But more importantly, it decreases the spell speed. So what that means, or the, we'll say the post-casting animations, there are certain phases of the spell animation that can be reduced by this, meaning... If you have this while fighting Vault Op, for example, it can allow you to stun lock with Rangers and Hunters. If you put this on a female force, she's suddenly able to basically cast almost like she could barehand cast as a male. And if you put this on a male, it's hilarious. Everything is stun lock forever. <laughs> like, so few things can get out of your stun lock in single player before dying. It's actually insane. This is pretty much a must have across the board for Vault Op. It's a absolute must-have for every player involving MST with the forces. It's an absolute must-have if you're using Raw Marl to unlock weapons or Hunu Roll to unlock weapons. Just a really solid unit. It'll be there pretty much with your battle units all the time. Up next, we have Heavenly Mind, which grants 45 to mind. Now, this is not something you'll explicitly hunt, but if you get four of these, you basically can power level all the characters in the game. So if you're not looking to power level characters, if you're not looking to make additional characters, it's less important. But being able to basically add 180 MST is so many raw levels of basically mind power that you skip. And this lets you teach basically everything. So you can only really hunt it in mid game. It's more useful for earlier characters. It's kind of unfortunate in that regard, but and it is just really solid. Note that you can only really hunt it in Episode 4, because Episode 4 is amazing. Uh, I would say of these choices... Oh, I missed one here. There we go. Sometimes I mean to remove it, sometimes I don't. That's an example where I did not mean to move it. That's why I always check as I go through the items to try to catch those. Uh, but Sky ID and Red ID have really common hunts on surface. And Red ID, to a lesser extent, has decent undergrounds as well with Heaven Striker. We'll talk about in a, in a little bit. Um, but those are very common runs. Those are available above ground and below ground. Technically, you can get it with Pink ID, which is really good, but typically you'd prefer not to do Pink ID surface, unless you're trying to get Heavenly HPs, of course. Uh, finally, we have in the list of... Phenomenal game-changing items. We have Limiter. We mentioned a little before, if you don't have the stat, if you don't have it unlocked via the seals with 20,000 kills, it gives you huge penalties to everything. However, if you kill 20,000 things with it, it upgrades into what is probably my favorite unit of the game, which gives 20 accuracy, so it's almost on par with Heavenly Arms. But, it gives 10 to everything else, and 6 to all resistances. So if you remember the Dress Plate plus Gracia combo, you're at 94. If you need Heavenly Arms to cap your ATA, wearing an Adept puts you at 100 EDK. So without needing to waste units on, like, Resist Devil, you're something that generically buffs everything that you have, and you just become basically unkillable. This is a really great thing to put on as, like, a luxury item on your Hunters and Rangers. They don't need the TP cost down. Forces do. I will state though that this is a preference for the Hugh New World because she uses TP a lot through Spirit and also needs a bazillion accuracy. 
So technically she's one of the only characters you'll see double stacking these. So she'll have decent dark resist if you're looking to do some runs. And more importantly, her spirit costs her down. And more importantly, she has 40 accuracy. So you'll see people swap into this over um, a Heavenly Arms, depending on where they are. But again, this is more of a luxury item. It's not needed on most hunters. In fact, it's not really needed on casts other than just to say, hey, I got free resists and stats. Uh, but I would say for forces, it's pretty much phenomenal. Being able to go through an entire area without needing to go back and get tri-fluids is super, super huge. So, I will also briefly show the screen that I'm looking at. So I will, I will denote that it stacks with other things that reduce TP costs, like the Psycho One and Sorcerer's Cane. Sorcerer's Cane I don't think I really go into details with. I guess we could briefly open up Sorcerer's Cane. Like, you, you can get it. It's... It's okay? It's okay. People don't normally pick this because it's 20% to the guy techniques. I guess in theory I could put this under situational. Maybe. I'll think about it. I'll think about it. But anyway. We'll close that. So having the TP cost reduction is pretty crucial. Uh, it's very useful when you're going back and unlocking items, but potentially if you're playing on normal mode and just blast killing everything for 20k kills, not needing to go back to shop is really, really, really huge. So it's definitely mandatory in certain runs, I feel, to avoid going back. It's, it's more of a luxury item, so technically skippable otherwise. Let's go into the situational items here. Sacred Duster. We talked about this very briefly, I won't go into detail here, but essentially it is the strongest option for Humars and Ramars for Vault Op casting with a fist type weapon. And it's pretty good ATP. So pretty solid all around. Uh, a little more situational. If you were using Guilty Light on other difficulties, Red Scorpio is technically a strict upgrade on it when it comes to those things. But it's just, it's just kind of okay. Oops, I got desynced. It's just kind of okay when it comes to those details, sadly. Like, you're not going to hunt for it explicitly. If you pick it up, it's nice. It helps a little bit with episode 4. Oop, it made it master. I know that is definitely Mazer, not master. So I don't really have much to say about these two weapon types. I mean, they're just slightly better guilty lights. If you find them, you'll use them. Kinds of things. They're they're okay. The fact that it pierces is kind of nice. So the Guilty Light, uh, Red Scorpio, and Fun on Mazer can hit small groups. Uh, the problem is this: their ATP doesn't scale. This I feel is probably also. I would just like to point out, chat. Fun on Mazer, 155 ATA, but it is such bad ATP. I feel like they did these weapons dirty. I really wonder if they had added maybe 250 attack power to this and like 125 to Red Scorpio if those would have actually been used. Because for the most part, you won't see people use it, but if you're on your way to getting a true endgame weapon, it is solid. It just, I wouldn't necessarily go out of my way to hunt it. But while you can technically find it in caves, in fact, you can find most of these in caves, now that I look back at it. Um, let me move these then. That is our criteria. If it's, if it's first in caves, I will move it back up here. I'll put them under situational. Sorry about that, got lost for a second. High up enough. In here. Okay, so I think from that perspective, it's, they're, they're decent. I'm not going to go out of my way to hunt them. Honestly, Guilty Light is probably good enough by itself, so that's why I put them more in Situational. But if you don't have Guilty Light from not doing... I think it's very hard mode ball up. Check the buffer guide for more details. Uh, then you are kind of missing out on an easy anti-air thing. And again, that's another weapon that can hit dragons out of the air. It can hit the Leaping Worm boss. It has its purpose. It's just... It's just okay. We briefly mentioned Musashi before. I don't really have anything to add. It's only found 
a couple places in ultimate, but dragon on hard mode can be, is universal. So if you feel like doing a lot of hard mode runs, by all means grind out the Musashi. But I don't know if it's like super, super worth it to be honest. Okay. Let's go to the MN60 Vice. This one I'm gonna put under situational. The reason I say it is that it's not really all that different in accuracy compared to a Vulcan, so let's compare the two weapons briefly. Open this up briefly. So if we look at the accuracy of this, it's 15 by default, you can get a 9 grind. This one can also get a 9 grind, so this goes to a max of 29, this one can get to a max of 34. It's very, like, minimally better. So, unless, unless specifically it's a 45 hit plus vice, it's generally not worth it over the equivalency Vulcan, sadly. And because it's so, so picky about it, it's not the best when it comes to that. I realized I didn't write where we get these particular things hunted. Let me check real quick. So the vice can be found in box drops, which is fine. I think from our perspective, there's nothing in caves for the vice explicitly. Oh no, no, there should be Balmer, right? Yeah, that Balmer is uh, a beast. So I'll move this one up slightly, I guess, as well, by criteria. So sadly, it's not really huntable on other difficulties outside of that. So let me just briefly add it. Sorry for moving the thing off screen. So we'll do caves as Volmer, purple. Like this. It's also huntable in jungle, seaside, mountain, CCA. Specifically with the old Gibbon. For, for episode 4, there's actually a good amount of choices. You can either do Surface with Babuda, or you could do Marissa A. Both of which are not super hard to do. Zabuda kills are pretty easy, especially as Purple ID. Presumably you'd be playing Ranger into it for sure. Yeah, we're just gonna go ahead and correct this and then move this. But the the sad part is, is it doesn't have like a huge advantage. This is what I consider more of like a luxury rare. Like it's not, it's not ever gonna be like the end all be all. It's like a very minor upgrade. That if you got it, it's it's good. But is it as game changing as getting like your first cannon rouge? Is it as good as getting your first? Uh, Excalibur? Not really. Let me go ahead and move this one up then. I think for some reason I forgot it. I wrote caves and then I realized, oops, it should probably be up here. We'll put this in situational, because again, it has to have high percentage. So yeah, so it's, it's worth trying to go for on the side, but I don't think it should ever be like your primary hunt. Like, you'll be doing something else with it. Like, it'll be, like, Psycho Wand with Vice or something like that. Where it'll be, like, Episode 4 so I could get, like, Yash Minikab and also get this. But it's not usually going to be your first and foremost. So I think that covers almost everything. So last up in terms of weapons, we have the Guardiana. So let's go ahead and reset this. This item, unfortunately, doesn't have a ton of accuracy, so unless it has a pretty high accuracy, and pretty high, I just mean, like, 35 plus. I don't mean, like, 80. 80 would be ideal, don't get me wrong. Uh, but it, it, it needs to basically at least mid-roll to be usable. Otherwise, it's just kind of okay. So essentially, it's used by Fomar to delete enemies, and that's pretty much its only purpose. I don't really have anything else to really say about it. It's one of those ones, it's really great if you are playing Ruins on purple and you happen to get it or ruins yellow sometimes happens we've done that before with an endless episode one for example we're just okay so now we'll go through the supports so we've actually gone through a majority of the items try not to rush it 
But essentially, this is the way to boost the shift in D-band range for male characters for the most part. Since a lot of the alternatives, like Terrell's Parasol that we mentioned earlier, can only be worn by females. Unfortunately, it is a rod type weapon, so just be really careful with casting this for, or casting damage spells with it while also using it. It requires you to do kind of a goofy thing where you go towards the future and then you go under a waterfall and it converts the weapon. It has its own little process. Briefly showcase that. Where you can do it, it just requires you to basically go to forest and then return back to the nurse. And you also have to have Striker Chow in your inventory for clarity, or else that doesn't happen. Uh, we probably have one of my more favorite support items, and you'll see me carry this on occasion. So it's a 900 MST to use, so not something you can use right away. It is anti as a special, which is okay. 50 defense is really good, 55 MST. Sadly, by this point, you don't really need MST. If you have 900 base, you don't need 55 from a weapon. But in theory, the MST is nice. More importantly, it gives 15 to all resistances, and if you somehow, for whatever reason, wield it for 10 minutes consecutively, it could be used to drain your health to 1 and then full restore your TP. I like it more for the fact that you can uh, boost the range of Jelen and Zalur for all forces, but it's also pretty good for surviving uh, attacks from things like Epsilon. Or anything that has like really high magic resist where I'm just waiting around. So for example, if I'm looking to survive Fall's attacks, I could just equip this so I just take way less damage as an example. Potentially even stand upright after being hit by a Grants as another example. So it has its uses. Let's talk about Cleo, which as we know is not usable by Humar, but Pumar. So they expanded it so the Hue Neural can use it since the MST requirement is 900 to use. It is an insanely high ATP weapon for a cane. I mean, it's almost 700. 70 MST, really solid. But again, you should have all your techniques by now. Uh, what people use it for is the Zalor uh, buff distance and sometimes the Grants bonus. Since because it's not a rod, it allows for faster casting than something like Mercurius Rod. I'm Sag going to bed now. Oh, poor Dego. But essentially, from the standpoint of this item, it's only findable on Dwarf on Declare and Ultimate. So any dwarf on normal hunt will go through that um, kind of process. But it is super good for the raw Marl in particular, and Huna Roll, to be able to get that boosted uh, gel in range. Otherwise, other things are generally preferred, like uh, Glide Divine. So now we're going to talk about this ridiculous set of items. So most of these things can only be formed in lower difficulties, or excuse me, found, not formed. But essentially, if you combine Odysseus, Brave Hammer, Glide Divine, and a King Striker, you will get the Mercurius Rod. The reason why I want to put this here is not because it gives a 30% grants bonus. You'll find any more buff before PGF this, I know. Oof. It can be used for the grants bonus. I don't like to use it because it is a rod, and as we mentioned before, rods are kind of slow. It does have a 80 MST bonus for only 770, which sometimes makes a difference. But honestly, the real reason people use this is Gafoe. So it's a low rank Gafoe that will basically be used to stop charges. That's what people use it for. But we don't care about the rest of the stats on the item, sadly. Now we're going to talk about some additional shields that potentially you could go into. I don't recommend hunting this one, but I figured I'd put this option out there for the very masochistic, very hard mode episode 2 players that might have this leading into ultimate. So... What does the shield do? It grants 35 ATP. Who can use it? Everybody. Where do you have to farm it? On ultimate, you have to fight Hadoom, which is spaceship. Do I recommend doing it? Probably not. But hey, if you happen to have it, you might as well do it. Not much else to say there. I would probably recommend farming it on very hard mode, to be honest, but that's just me, I guess. What's up next, we have the d relay shield. This is a very high defense shield that I did like using on some of my male characters, in particular the Ramar, before I ended up getting something like Red Ring. The reason why this is kind of nice is if you don't have any debuffs, or your debuffs are on the weaker end, the roll defense means that you don't die instantly to Sinnoh. This is pretty much the edge case of why I would recommend it. 
I do find it was very good initially, but it's definitely not as good as some of the uh, endgame shields, which we'll discuss in a moment. Also, just for clarity, I'm gonna make a note here. I'll, I'll reformat slightly, I think, later. But essentially, uh, you do need the D-Role shell, which comes from D-Role or Barber Ray. But also you need to hunt, uh, potentially, the Stink Shield from Vol Op or Gal Griffin's Viridia. So, it can be kind of annoying to assemble, but it does have a level requirement to get to, so it's not too bad. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about PB Create. So this is probably, I think, a unit that most people kind of sleep on, unfortunately. I guess in theory I can move this up higher, since I think it does have- yeah, it does have one cave hunt. So, the reason why I think this item is really good, at, really, at least it's good enough to go into situational, is the fact that there are a lot of times in certain runs, in particular for Okaflow or for things like Endless, or for things like Episode 4 bosses, where it is expected for you to basically go through, and you need to be able to have Mag Blast before you get to a certain point. Or if you're playing uh, solo cast, you just need Mag Blast as quickly as possible. So what you could do when you, you get higher level and you have more open slots, you just kind of run some PB creates. So this means you don't have to worry about taking damage, this means you don't have to worry about not DPSing. So for example, if you have a lot of hell items or you're using a lot of charge, but you need to have a certain charge by a certain point, um, it does enable those options to you. Now granted, it's not going to be as strong as just straight stat buffs, so it's not something you're going to do over like a Heavenly Arms, but when you get towards the end of the game, honestly, especially with Force, if you're playing like Force ATP, you're like, I only need so many weapons to be useful. Like, how, how dedicated am I going to be to the V502 in a particular run? Do I really need to do it? over some of these other characters. And I feel like the answer to that is usually no. So for me personally, because I don't have a lot of V5 units and I don't have a, a whole ton of high hit items for forces, I usually end up just preferring like a PB create on certain runs rather than go in with my own paralysis. Like I'll also recognize if I'm like a force with a whole bunch of other people, am I really gonna be the one that's gonna paralyze the Gurdabulu or am I gonna be doing Slicer Fanatic Glitch? And that which doesn't require a unit. Do you know what I mean? So it's just one of those things where you know, we'll consider it. Probably a staple unit for the five people that have unsealed J Sword. Possibly true. The downside is you have a little less control over when you get it because it's constant. So unless you are micromanaging uh, when you receive it, it can be a little brutal. I'm gonna say it can be picked up. It can be attained from 1k corn gamble. I think from this alone, I think I have to put this in the lower slots. So, like, I'll run this as force when I have nothing better to do. Like, I'll, I'll give an example. If you're a force that doesn't have adept and you have a V801 and you already have heavenly battle equip, what do you, what else are you really gonna be running? Do you know what I mean? Like, there's, there's really not that many interesting options to run as a force. Like, if you have them, great, but I'm um, like, most players will not have, like, triple adept. Or at least you have to grind in order to get to tri triple adept. So what do you have in your slots before then? Because essentially things like Heavenly Mind are going to cap out. God Technique, you'll have one of. The one of fun of. Let's say it's Heavenly Battle, V801, God Technique, free slot. Might as well make it PB Create. It's not like you don't need Mag Blast for uh, Episode 4 boss. Or at least enough to donate. I think that covers most of those basic items. Let's move on to... Also, I guess I'll make a note here. It can technically be used to um, form a unit called PB Increase. So instead of once every 23 seconds, which is PB Create, uh, you could create PB Increase, which is once every 18 seconds. It's a very minor optimization. You could do it if you're bored. It's not required. They do stack, though, which leads to some hilarity. Because I would say, like, every 20 seconds, basically getting 3 PB is actually pretty good. 
especially on like 12 minute or 15 minute quests with forces, it pretty much locks in you having PB blasts by stacking them. So especially if you're not planning on attacking or you have, you know, all that you need already, you don't need god technique because your techniques are strong enough. You don't think like Rifoi with like 30 tech damage really matters. 2 PB creates is pretty good. 3 PB creates is insane. So just think about it that way. It is kind of nice. So we'll go to a extraordinarily niche item. But I figured I'd mention it here. So Divine Protection only works when the 100 digits of the beat timer is odd. When it is odd, it gives 20 to EDK, which is technically better than Resist Devil, which only gives 15, and 20 Light Resist, which is also nice, and it also doubles your luck, which is also nice. I think they should hashtag free Divine Protection. I, I feel like if they're going to remove Beat Claw, they should at least make it do something on Even Beat. So... It's really good in Lily runs for other characters. So, for example, females with um, just the armor for Brightness Circle would have 65 EDK with two Divine Protections. That's usually good enough, honestly, to get through caves. But again, it's situational, and you'll have to make up at least like 10 to 20 EDK, depending on your shield, uh, with your shield itself, actually, in order to bridge the gap between that and the common items. So very situational. Not something I would go out of my way to hunt, but you'll probably get it fighting Zabudas. Up next we have Heavenly Ability, which can be farmed in uh, Jungle Seaside's um, Mountain CCA. From Gibbles, which is a somewhat likely hunt. You'll probably see them more in Tower, honestly, than CCA. Or you could just do Episode 4 Boss Rush, which is more likely to happen, to be honest with you. The 25 to all stats just means it's just 5 points better than God Ability. And the fact that it gets 2.5 accuracy does make a difference. It's like another level or two where you could get away with that instead of a Heavenly Arms in order to hit max accuracy. So again, it's just kind of like, it will have its niche. It'll be used for like 3 levels of your character as you get towards max stats, and then never again. Similarly, Heavenly Luck just means that if you're expecting your building based off of whether or not you have Red Ring, it might be worth using this if you don't have all your luck materials. Um, otherwise, something like Heavenly Ability would be slightly better. Since the assumption in most of those builds is you're off by about 20 luck, and, that, and Heavenly Ability gives 25, so it just kind of fills the gap nicely. I would say more in the very niche territory, Heavenly Power. Heavenly Power gives 55 ATP. Don't get me wrong, it's actually really good. It's actually really, really, really good in terms of uh, how many stats it provides. The problem is that power is not the end-all be-all for most of these characters. So most of the time you want to be stacking accuracy. One of these here. I'll actually move this one up one. So sadly, it just has like one of those issues where it's really great and it's like a core item if you're a force and you're like, I need to use this Excalibur. I need this Excalibur. Like, there, like I, I cannot function without this weapon. It is one of the best units in the game. After that, it's not worth anything. It, if it doesn't give literally its full bonus, usually you just kind of chuck it. It's just one of those things. So it's usually better to have accuracy, and some characters can't afford to juggle both. If you have nothing else, it's just kind of a filler unit as you slowly remove accuracy. But it's nothing too, too crazy, sadly. I think we covered all of the units then. So we're, we're finally out of the mid-game. Hello, this is post-commentary Ziggy here. So in the process of editing the final part just a little bit, I decided to go back and update the guide. And I was kind of on the fence about this, but I think overall it'll be helpful to discuss. So there are two topics that I feel needed to go in slightly more detail to talk about uh, other endgame goals other than potentially just the drops themselves. So photon drops play a very big role within Fantasy Star, even if you're not looking to do from a trading purpose exactly, uh, to use them as the currency for trading. Let's go ahead and open up the 
other window so we could see the ways in which it could be used. The main reason that people use it is specifically for creating something known as a photon sphere. So normally what will happen is you want to get to the end of the game, you have a collection of maybe 30 hit plus uh, ultra rare weapons, or you have like 55 hit rare, more common items. Uh, but essentially you want to take those weapons and push them to their limit. So what you can do is you take a whole bunch of these photon drops, convert them into the spheres because it gives you more attribute boost than if you do the photon drops by themselves and you convert them directly into percentages to a weapon. So Photon Sphere directly gives 30% to an attribute. You cannot have more than three attributes on any given weapon, two if it happens to be sealed, and you can never add beyond that. So the, the max is 100%, you can't give yourself like 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, etc. So just be aware that once a weapon even has even just 5% in an attribute, that attribute is locked in. You cannot get rid of it. So, a lot of the hunts in PSO end up being finding weapons that are either consistent to upgrade, so your monster part weapons, and then sphering those, uh, which we'll talk about later with the Brands Launcher, or potentially finding some ultra rare commons and potentially pumping them up once they've converted into rare items. So, for example, Dark Flow is a weapon that we'll be talking about later that covers that particular category. So just be aware that PDs are used for a lot of different item creation, and we're not even going to go super deep into that in this particular guide. The proper guide covers a lot more of that in general. But just be aware that just because you can necessarily get some of the items we're going to talk about doesn't mean that you should. So really, really think about if you want to save up PDs for a challenge mode weapon, as those are more... I would say game warping than some of the really expensive PD creation items. I more mention them for goals for people that are really done with the game and maybe already have those since PDs aren't necessarily the hardest thing to accrue at the end of the game, but it's not necessarily a focus to put on some of these things. So think about if you want to save up some PDs for basic trades or if you want to convert them into a component so that way you can upgrade into other items or if you want to directly just add attributes because you've already found you know your your one and only super weapon kind of thing so keep that in mind pds now super 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 important even more than they were before and that's just one thing i just wanted to emphasize before we go into the second topic so the second topic i was on the fence about uh adding was common weapons so common weapons aren't really something you hunt per se until I thought about it a little more, and honestly, if you have access to Restless Lion Episode 4, it kind of really is just an underground hunt with the side effect of Megat is actually really use useful there, as well as Hell, because you're killing uh, NPCs that are weak to it, and they drop set items. The only thing that is different is that if the person always drops a ray gun, it could be a charge ray gun, it could be a flame ray gun, it could be like a whole bunch of different things. So I think with that, I think it earns its spot towards the end of the common weapon list. Let me scroll down a little bit and discuss this. So from that standpoint, the common weapons will start showing up in the shop. I'm going to say around 150. I take this with a grain of salt. I couldn't find an exact value or an exact chart specific to Affinia. So this is just from experience. I've seen them by at least 150. Um, they could show up as early as 120, who knows? Keep an eye out on the shop, but by the time you've already gotten through early game and mid game, this is where those checks become more serious. And the reason why this is important is that there are really, really strong 50 hit common items, which we'll go over in more detail talking about the Restless Lion, but these are the kind of items that almost any alt character can use, and even to some extent your end game character will use because they are just that good. So don't sleep on common weapons, they are really, really strong. And so let's talk about some of the things that you can find in Restless Lion. So uh, one thing that makes that really strong uh, as a quest to do is not only that as a set weapon, but it potentially gives three attributes of 50. So what that means is that potentially, ideally, you're going to find something like a caliber with any special, two attributes, and a hit. Uh, it, it could even technically have no special, honestly, but for the, for the sake of, of discussion, it, it doesn't matter if it has a special. From that standpoint, that particular weapon, preferably with Dark and Machine over some of the other options, 
will build into a weapon called the Dark Blow. This is an endgame weapon for hunters, which we'll go into more details in a little bit. But just be aware that this is so strong that people will trade for it, people will bargain for it. It is really good, and the quest is not that hard to run, aside from being an underground, which can be a little rough, I would say, for melee characters specifically in solo play. But in, I would say in most scenarios, as long as you have a hell gun, you're probably going to be fine through most of it. Minus, I think, like one room in that quest, because there's not too many enemies it wants to deal with compared to other quests. Uh, one other thing you'll pick up is potentially a ray gun, Vulcan, Gunnier, Caliber, Slicer, with Charge, Berserker, Spirit. Uh, preference very heavily on Charge. Berserk is okay. Sometimes it's useful for draining your own health, for example, when you need to reduce your health for certain specials, or you're looking to manipulate your health for Mag Blast, uh, or not Blast, Blast, Mag Triggers, involving being at low health. So sometimes Berserk is more useful than Charge in those scenarios, and also in things like Endless, where there might be a restriction on using it to clear the quest uh, and get the max reward. And I put Spirit there. It's okay. I don't generally recommend this over most options. So if you're really desperate, you can use it, but it's probably better just to farm for the other first two types I just mentioned. Uh, but the reason being that uh, Ray Gun is pretty much in an endgame pistol. The charge Ray Gun, that is, for raw cast. Oh, I put raw cast, excuse me, it's Hugh cast. For Hugh cast. Just because of the fact that all he really cares about is accuracy to strike falls. And the fact that you can also potentially multiply that damage by quite a bit means that you have a really good option for the uh, long distance shots you need to make against falls and that. Um, in addition, for Vulcans in particular, Vulcans are pretty much used start to finish. If you happen to get a high level uh, Vulcan in terms of hit percentage, you will probably be using it the entire game, arguably even over every other rare that we've discussed up until this point. Charge Vulcan in particular is just so powerful on so many characters, and it just does so much damage because of the fact that it's one of the unreduced specials. So the fact that you hit multiple times and all that damage is multiplied means as you get further and further into the game, you have higher and higher ATP, you just end up deleting everything. So you could just beat enemies down with your raw stats from levels, and yeah, it's pretty much a best in slot for most characters. Uh, honorable mentions to Gunnir and Caliber for methods to clear the Episode 4 Lizards, and also to some extent clear normal rooms in case you're not able to set up a very effective uh, Diska combo on most enemies, for example. Or if you don't have the ability to wear 13, maybe you have a character that's a bit lower level, like they're your ult, maybe they just, maybe they just came fresh into Ultimate, or maybe uh, they, you just rolled super bad on Disco Brave Man and you're still kind of hunting it out, but you still need a method of clearing. Slicer's pretty good at destroying things, so... Uh, it You will probably prefer to use Disco Brave Man over, like, a Berserk Slicer or a Charge Slicer, but just be aware that it is an option and it's just much easier to get access to, both in terms of ATP requirements and uh, minimum level for the armor. And it also frees it up in case you are looking to do builds other than 13 uh, to basically crowd control a room. So the final two specials that are worth mentioning, both of them involving Ray Gunner Laser, are Demon and Hell. These are your classic support items, and they will carry you really, really far in most areas. You're going to be using demons on a lot of mini-bosses, wound them, preferably if your teammates can freeze or paralyze the target to improve your accuracy, especially on characters like Forces that really need all the help they could get in order to land the shots. And Hell will disenable so many runs. And ironically, Hell makes the run Restless Lion even easier because you end up using Hell in order to defeat the human characters that hold these weapons or basically the non-monsters that hold it. So just be aware that it's not too bad of a hunt. It's definitely worth adding and specifically mentioning here because it is basically an underground run with light enemies and uh, heavy... Um, I would say encouragement to use hell to speed it up. But finally, if you're looking to get the beyond 50 hits, if you're looking for your, you know, 80 hit caliber or your like 90 hit uh, slicer for crazy rainbow batons, unfortunately that just requires you to going to end game areas and either running classic box quests like uh, Phantasmal World 3 Seabed, or you just have to be checking boxes in tower because you're hunting for other items. 
just be aware that those are really, really, really rare. I don't know the exact percentage, but I would put them on par somewhere between Ubers and, and Ubers with really good stats. Like, it it is deceptively hard to get these, to get everything to line up, like which attributes you get, uh, the hit percentage amount. Also, it has a reduced odd of it being in hit in general, and also having the right special and the right weapon type. It's really a lot of things that have to come together. So it's inconsistent. Don't expect to get this within like 200,000 boxes, like honest statement. It's it's pretty bad. It's not guaranteed. You might get some decent like 65 hits or 70 hits on the on the way up to the high hits. But yeah, don't don't expect this to drop like candy. This is definitely a very hard run, but it's something that you could keep in mind in why you should open boxes in pretty much all of these end game areas because any of them could potentially give you a very high hit version of any of the things that we just mentioned. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ask Me and include the guide. So we almost did it, chat. We're almost at the end. Hang in there. Let's talk about endgame items. Now, I just want to be very clear. When I say endgame, I don't mean necessarily they're best in slot. I just mean that you have to be at the end of the game in order to acquire them. However, there are some exceptions, of course. Let's take a look at Zamba. Zamba is your makeshift buster sword. It's got an okay damage range, decent grinder range, has berserk. It's the basically the Humar Hughcast alternative to uh, Flowin Sword 3084 with Spirit. And Berserk is generally preferred over Spirit in that sense. Otherwise, if it doesn't really roll with hit percentage, uh, generally Red Sword will be a little better. So just be aware of it. Up next, we have a Fantastic Partisan. It actually has pretty decent accuracy, almost 50. Damage range is about the same as Tyrell's. In fact, let's do a quick comparison against Tyrell. Yeah, Tyrell's, Tyrell's is a little weaker, with, but gives more utility. Also gives charge instead of Berserk. However, it has a little bit of a grind. The problem with this one is that you can only really hunt Morphles with it, and Morphles are not really the most fun thing to fight in Fantasy Star. They're not the worst, but they are very annoying without Hell items. So, if it comes with basically min hit percentage, I would say it's usable in Hugh Casil. Otherwise, the other characters generally need like 20, 30, 40, respectively, kind of things. But it's one of those ones you'll hunt on your way through uh, Respective Tomorrow, for example, with Blue ID in particular. So it's just something to keep in mind. Up next, we have one of the run-defining items, so I'm going to skip straight to the item itself, but it's Parasitic Gene Flow. Parasitic Gene Flow can be found on Oga Flow, on Viridian, Blue ID, Purple Non, Pinkle, Orange, or Yellow Boss. And the reason that you have this weapon, number one, high ATP, requirement 971 for some reason, question mark, you do it for its special. The reason why this is important is that if you're under... Let me show you the thing I'm looking at. So if you're under 12.5% health, you will shoot out five beams of light. These five beams of light will delete everything in the game. It's a risk-reward weapon. You have to be low health, but if low health, you delete enemy. So just don't get hit. Don't get chipped out by set damage. Don't get frozen. Don't get trapped. Play really well. So they fortunately have heavy attack accuracy, so they're not the worst to land compared to some other specials. I think another example is Frozen Shooter that uses heavy accuracy instead of special to determine the accuracy of the weapon. But yeah, this is the this is the weapon for hunters. If you're wondering how you deal with bosses and all those other things, it's uh it's Dark Flow. <laughs> it's Dark Flow time chat. You know what I didn't see in here, chat, which I find kind of weird? One second. I want to see where I put it. Where did I not put it in here? I'm going to cancel that real quick. Did I not have an entry for Spread Needle? Huh. 
I missed spread needle chat. One moment. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. I'm forgetting a core item. Shame on me. So anyway, let's go backwards slightly. So we have uh, one of the ranger only staples. The problem with it is that it is a ruins hunt. So I kind of view this as more of a mid game item. Like it's it's not hard to hunt on most characters except for red ID because it needs uh, Darkbringer to get it. So let's go ahead and add an entry in and talk about why this weapon is super good. I think we talked about it in parts in other areas and I think I just forgot to add an official entry for it. So we'll put it more under the support item since you generally won't use it for damage. So we talked about Bringer's right arm. I'm going to put Spread Needle right there. So let's go back to uh, the guide itself. The Spread Needle. Normal, normal, normal. Attack chain with 40% accuracy or 40% attack speed, excuse me. Uh, stun locks. Most enemies. And vault up. Phase 1. C special is worse. Uh, is is okay for status control. However, humans will prefer to use S rank for the status chance. I think that's a fair description. Spread Needle. It is very good. A lot of people will use this constantly throughout the game itself. And it's not bad at damage. But yeah, we could definitely do a little better with the cleanup here. One moment. Sorry about that. So we could get it from Merlins, which are just grunt enemies in Ruins, but also the Darkbringer on Red ID. It's okay. So specifically, I would say for these, I wouldn't recommend doing the Darkbringer hunt. That's more for something of when you are already able to handle TTF, you would go and do this. Otherwise, the other ones are a lot safer to do, and you will probably end up doing them as part of uh, something simple like Endless Nightmare 4, I believe is the name of the quest. But anyway, let's, let's proceed. I think we named all the other items here. I'm not going to worry about that. So we talked about Dark Flow's Laser Light Show. We don't need to worry about that. Let's talk about the Baran's Launcher. This one, I've seen it when it's fully maxed, and it looks great. Until you spear it, I don't know if I'm really sold on this item, to be honest with you. So the thing that you're comparing it against in terms of endgame shotguns... You have, an, you have a charge arm, which is about 100 ATP less. Versus a four-shot, slower version shotgun. So, like, Baran's Launcher can be good. You can get it up to 50 accuracy. That's not the problem with it. The problem with it is that it only really starts to outshine the charge arm when you start really stacking in spears. So... Using Photon Spheres to add uh, bonuses to Machine or Dark in order to uh, lead to one-shots is really good, but it is extraordinarily expensive. So this is typically one of the last things that you focus on. So we'll talk more in the trading guide, but as good as this can be, it is not worth doing before getting a majority of these items, even from a hunting perspective. It's nice to pick up though. If you don't have a charge arm, it's better than nothing, but you will find the slow projectile speed leads to some awkwardness unless you can freeze the enemy solid. So just be aware of that. So I've been teasing this item since the beginning, so let's go to probably my next favorite weapon, because this weapon is just absolutely disgustingly broken, and I don't understand why it's like it. But anyway, we have a handgun that gives MST for some reason, because of course it does. Um, ridiculous number of stars, 200 ATA requirement, which is really high. That is pretty much endgame stats, and or tons of heavenly arms. It could be used by every ranger, so we talked about a little bit last time that Striker Unit allows you to do Divine Punishment, which lets you clear all of Episode 4 really easily, but its other special, which is Berserk, with a shotgun range and radius, basically auto-aiming anywhere near targets, can hit enemies off-screen, like Ogaflow, it can pivot you without you needing to turn, which is useful for dealing with Indie Belra, it does fantastic damage, 
It scales extremely well with uh, enemy percents to the point where if you have like a 50 dark heaven striker, you're basically combo killing everything in solo. Like, I just don't see most things surviving a combo with this gun if you're able to land the special. Which is not a very tall requirement coming for rangers, being able to land hits. So absolutely silly. I, th this is probably the only time I will note this in particular. The drop rates on Seabed and Ruins uh, when it comes to Heaven Striker are just terrible. Don't don't run them there. They, they're so bad currently. One day they will be buffed and they will be worth running, but honestly, just play Underground. Either go for Boss Rush and something like uh, Point of Disaster, or just play your normal Green Red ID boss clears. Because both of them give stuff that you're interested in. Green ID getting Galatine, of course, and also potentially Heavenly's. Red ID getting, uh, I think, Heavenly Ability and Centurion from the main bosses. It's just one of those things. Th this is one of those weapons you will come back to hunt over and over and over again. It is absurd how powerful it is. It allows you to one-shot basically everything with any given percentage. So we'll talk about this, the heart piece. Oh, excuse me, magical heart piece. It did not like my search. This one's also kind of a luxury rare. Or excuse me, it's this magical piece. It's it's heart key. It's magic rock heart key is the thing that forms it. Not magical. Oh, right there. It's really good, but really expensive. Again, I would say in general, this is one of the things you go for last, and that's why I put it in the end game category. Technically, you really don't need that much. Magic Rock Pula is a very easy item to get, but because it has a 50 PG requirement, I can't recommend this to new players. This is like when you're done with the game. I just want to be very clear. This is when you have nothing left you want to purchase, including S ranks. Everything is done, then you come back to this. However, you can pick up the pieces needed for it, so it's important to know that you need the Magic Rock Heart Key, and then you also need something to combine it with. Yeah, so sadly, unless you have a ton of PDs, this option's kind of off the table for the most part. So let's move on to Lieutenant Mantle, which is a fantastic armor. Um. It's sometimes used more than the ATP armors, just from the standpoint that it gives the human characters, like the, including the Newmans, uh, Hunters and Rangers, the ability to see traps. And it also gives Forces the ability to see traps, which sometimes you will, it's more situational, I would say, for Forces than Hunters and Rangers. For Hunters and Rangers, is just kind of an auto pick. It has like solid resist, it's got solid defense. If you don't have 13, there's no reason to not wear this. There's a lot of situations, especially in like episode 1 and episode 4, where traps are really deadly. Rather than wasting a slot on trap vision, if you don't really need 13, because you're not using slicers, for example, which I do recommend that you use, uh, it does let you kind of insta-kill walls and walls of traps. So typically there will be somebody that will bite the bullet, as it were, in order to use them. Sometimes it's the ranger, sometimes it's the horse. It also has the benefit of having actually pretty good defense overall. Evade could do a little better. Resists are actually a pretty solid. It is a pretty solid stat line across the board. Like 16 dark and 6 to the other resists is actually pretty good. Now we're going to talk about the item to end all items for sure. The infamous hunt that everybody does if they play PSO. And that is Red Ring to show off the red ring there. So what does it do? Well, the answer is basically everything. Oops, I slid that over by accident. I think the box is so wide it doesn't fit normally. We'll, we'll do this for now. Put it in the middle. So from the perspective of red ring itself, let's stretch this a little. It adds 20 to basically all stats, including accuracy, and because it adds to accuracy and ATP, it could go over your cap. So what does that mean? So most characters have a hard limit of how much ATP they can have. Uh, for example, I think Phone Newman is like 802 or something silly. Like, they, it's, very, it's very close to 800. 
This would allow you to get 20 more ATP. And in return, any armor or shield that adds ATP is also added to the weapon boosts. So if I have a 100 native weapon and I have red ring, I get the equivalency of 40 ATP instead of 20. So this is just another way to squeeze out like four to five extra levels of damage and gets better as you start sphering and upgrading your items. On top of that, it has really solid elemental resists, which means doing falls runs are pretty easy. It's got very lackluster dark and light resist, but honestly, it has basically everything else. This is the end all be all shield. In Affinia, the level cap was raised to 180. That way, not literally every person uses it as they play the game, so there's no reason to use other armor or other shields. But yeah, it is just all powerful. Knowing which runs can do falls, Viridian, Green, Sky, Red, and White, is very important, and that will decide your entire basis of doing runs, honestly. Where you will be like, this character will do towards the future for 100 levels until they get Red Ring. So just be aware, this is one of the best shields in the game. It also gives slow HP and TP regen on top of that, which is not as useful. In fact, in some scenarios, it's good to not have that, especially if you're playing, uh... If you're playing, like, cast in particular, and you're looking to not get out of Dark Flow range, that does become annoying. So just be aware of that. We talked about this item a little earlier, so let's go view it now. We'll shrink this back down, I think. There we go, that's good enough. So I think from that perspective, we have V502. We mentioned it briefly. It's sadly only found outside of tower if you fight the miracles. Actually, that's not spelled correctly. I know it should be Mary Carol. There we go. I remembered how to spell it this time. Uh, so you can do very specific green ID hunts to hunt them in episode two outside of tower. Otherwise, you're in Ilgil o'clock and you need to be able to fight as purple, red, or white. Purple and white tend to be really good end game choices for tower in particular, so you'll see those over red ID for the most part. But yeah, it, it's pretty much run defining. Having this item is the difference between needing to shoot three times to kill an enemy versus six to seven. It really, really, really improves clear speed overall, especially in episode two with health. Otherwise, if you're just looking to boost Confuse, Freeze, or Paralysis, V501 is just as good for those and easier to get to some extent. Okay. Let's talk about some situational weapons. So up up next we have Twin Blaze. In one moment. So again, unfortunately, it's another one that's kind of annoying to get. You either do basically Tower for Mary Kill, because that one is not as common as the Mary Carol. Is the, the other one. So that usually restricts you to hard CCA and tower runs, unfortunately. Or you just do Sky ID Morphos, which is more manageable. The reason people use this, it is an okay double saber. I mean, it gets up to 520. That I mean, that's that's solid. It's not the best in the game, but it'll take you to end game potentially. Too bad you need to be at end game to acquire this item. People do take this for the Kapoe, though. So this is one of the few ways you can have a cast, either Ranger or Hunter. Basically, Gafoe to stop the Dorfon, Delbeater, Zoo Dives, etc. Uh, I think also you could split slimes with it with Twin Blaze, technically. I don't think I've ever bothered with it. I've always preferred Flame Trap, to be honest. But just be aware that that's a thing you could do. Up next, we have another monster part weapon. Now this one is pretty situational, but it is really fun when you have it set up properly. So what does it do? Well, it's a special see other page. The reason you want to do this is that it drains 7% of your health per attack, which is not great, but the third hit drains 21%. The reason why that's important, other than losing almost literally half your health in a combo, which is hilarious by the way, uh, it does trigger your mag. So this is one of the few ways that you as a force have agency in the awful hell dungeons that are episode 2 tower, seabed, uh, potentially multiplayer ruins. Being able to trigger invincibility or fish for it in between rooms 
is really, really huge. Just imagine having a weapon that can give you 30 seconds of invulnerability. Let's say you need 5 seconds to walk into position. 25 seconds of uninterruptible tech and demons and hell. Kind of ridiculous. Downside, you need other items for it to be good. Other downside, it does come from Gal Griffin and it has the same drop odds as Parasitic Gene Flow. So, a little awkward, but could be worse. Let's go ahead and move on to our next set of situational items. This one I think is a Hellcleave favorite. I'm, I'm growing to love it a little more off stream. And that is Mother Garb. Mother Garb basically reduces all TP costs by 50% and randomly can also boost Grant's damage by 10%. So both things are very good for clearing in episode 4. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing this per se. I would just double check to see if you fail to hit a threshold. So normally what happens is you need about 40% added to a particular element in order to shorten how many casts that you need. So it really just depends on your gear if this even impacts your run at all. If you have truly optimized gear like Psycho Wand, which we'll talk about in a little bit I suppose, or um, you know, all your merges, then like maybe being at 70% doesn't make a difference for you on most enemies. It's something you have to kind of feel for if it would slow down the run. However, this is a fantastic item to always have when you unseal because it's just another way of reducing how much you uh, need to spend. So typically when you unseal, you have like three to four limiters on you and no V801 because you want to unlock as much as possible in one shot. So finding another way of reducing TP is actually really crucial for that. So I like Phonumen for unlocking for that reason. Uh, along those lines, there's just a very simple upgrade to it which is Mother Garb Plus. So take a look, 101 level requirement, 18 to the resist, 180 defense, not bad. But now three more resist, 10 more defense, a little bit more evade, and instead of 10% grants bonus, it's 30%. The downside to it is that you have to fight a rare boss for it on blue ID or pink ID. Not the end of the world, but it's just like a very minor upgrade. Mother Garb by itself is much easier to hunt, and the random grants bonus sometimes matters, but usually not. It is a nice way to give yourself grants bonus, though. I actually really wish this went on Fomoral, to be honest, instead of uh, Phonumen. It would have been nice if they had alternated uh, who had access to it, or the Phonural. If one of those was the Phonural, like Mother Guard Plus was Phonural. I think that would have made a lot of sense, to be honest. But anyway, we're not here to really question the absolute insanity that is PSO balancing. So we'll move forward. So let's talk about a kind of annoying item to get to. Let me minimize this. The Sweetheart. So again, another one with the Love Heart stuff. This one requires a lot of Magical Rock Heart Keys. And this is only for the absolute diehard female characters. So what it can grant you is essentially a... Basically an increased... Hold on, I just want to make sure this is the right one. Yes. So, as long as you're near other male characters, you will get an increased ATP, so 15%, 20%, 25%, based off of one, two, or three male characters that are close to you, in exchange for losing defense. Defense is not the end of the world. Um, this is useful for Volt Op. It speeds up Volt Op if people's group around the character. However, it is really, really, really expensive. Because you need a heart key in order to get the love heart, and then, and it is result of combining a spirit garment. So that needs 100 PDs for a very minor boost. It's good, but don't get me wrong, this should not be your focus. Let me be very clear, this should not be your focus. This is a great, I'm done with the game item. But yeah, that's why we put it under situational. If it wasn't that expensive, it would be great. I think something that's also potentially very expensive, but is more realistic to achieve than the other item, is something called the Virus Armor La Futeria. So it requires a lot of parasitic cell type Ds, which are combination items that I believe cost 20 per in the shop. So these require 80 total PDs to create the armor, or during events, there's a discount it is in Affinity, I believe it is 16 gold badges equals a cell. 
So technically you can farm gold badges somewhat easily in ultimate in order to get this. And it's not bad. I, I think I would still probably prefer those badges to go towards a weapon sphere. But if you're looking for an option to basically have an unkillable uh, non-cast character, it's really hard to top 290 defense. Between that and Red Ring, you are basically immortal with any basic debuff. And the fact that Forces could use it too is hilarious. Like, I, I did use this very briefly as a joke on my Fomarl, just to see how unkillable she is. The answer is, I don't think she got hurt by anything that wasn't set damage until I hit Ruins. If I gel into Sinnoh, legitimately could not take damage. The amount of, I cannot understate how powerful this is defensively, but again, it's very expensive. So, if you're considering trading, hold off on this. But realize that this is a very, very strong pickup for late game, just due to its raw defense. This also makes things like endless no damage clears like a total joke <laughs> in solo play. You're like, wait a minute, I can't even be hurt by anything prior to anything caves and lower. Oops. Alright chat, we're getting there. Getting there. Fortunately, the last few pages, we're not going to go into big details. So talking about situational, uh, if you are a hunter in particular, and you would like to be immune to Lily, this shield grants you 80 EDK. If you're a Hugh cast, and you have, or even a Humar, and you have Dressplate on, you have like 120 EDK, you're unkillable. This is one of the few ways females can just be straight up immune to Lily. With uh, Brightness Circle, it's 85 total EDK, which is higher than most of their Megids. And combine that if they have an Adept, like let's say they are, again, trying to add accuracy, then they have 91 EDK. Which basically means there's a less than 10% chance most things will ever kill you, if not literally zero. But between those items, you could just have Hyper EDK. Downside, it requires you to complete Terrell's Ego in under an hour by killing all enemies, which is kind of annoying. I think on stream we'll probably do that soonish, as I've always wanted to do the official run for this on stream. But it is what it is there. Champ, we're at the final, the final huntable item. We did it. We're at the. We're at the, We have other things to talk about, but we're at the final item. Centurion ability. So this can only be found on Kondryu and Viridian, Green Sky, and Redria. And this gives three accuracy, which, as I said before, is important when you're getting rid of your heavenly arms. Thirty ATP is actually pretty huge, as is the defense. And that, more often than not, will help you clear basic areas. So if you did want something that boosted ATP instead of Heavenly Arm, I'd probably recommend this. Just because it gives you attack points, or attack power, and it gives you luck, and it gives you accuracy, and a little bit of defense, and a little bit of evade if you're doing episode 4, and MST if you're just trying to rest to heal. So it's just overall a really good unit. It's not something you're going to replace over some of the other staples we mentioned. But if you don't have them, I mean, it's really good for what it is. So with that, we've described every item that you can hunt from, or at least purchase from the standpoint of the shop that is worth grabbing. We cleared pre-ultimate, we've gone down to end of ultimate. Now we have a whole nother can of worms. S-rank weapons. I call them S-rank weapons, they're technically ES weapons. They're... We call them S-Rank weapons because you need to get S-Rank in challenge mode in order to get the item. So let's briefly close this and showcase this. There is a whole list of these ES weapons that require you to complete either Episode 1 or Episode 2. So depending on what episode you're in, you can pick these up. So why are these good? They don't come with any hit percentage, but... They allow an extraordinarily high number of grinds. You see how there's like 200, 220, 250. So their base damage is actually pretty high. They're not gonna necessarily out ATP the other things, but they're good enough to follow up as like a kill percentage. Let's get rid of the tall box. I don't think I need that anymore. But the real reason people use it, and this is where a lot of your endgame PDs will be going, over the other options I just mentioned. 
specials. So let's say, for example, you want a mech gun. So ES mech gun, as an example. I guess I could pop it back on for this one. It grinds up to 50, so it actually has 60 ATP, which is pretty high for a mech gun. Not usable by Fomaro or Fomaro, but the specials on this are not reduced. What does this mean? If you put Demon on this and you shoot nine shots of special, you will potentially Demon the target nine times in a row. I cannot state how unfair this is. And we'll, we'll give some vague rankings and talk about what specials are worth gathering, but that's an example. So this mech gun is already stronger in terms of base ATP than most other mech guns, because most of them have 35 or less ATP. It's already better there, but accuracy is lower. So some characters take advantage of mech guns, or not mech guns, they take advantage of ES weapons a lot more than others, like basically all of the rangers do in particular. Uh, but it is still useful to pick up for hunters and forces. Let's go ahead and go back to the gun. So, in addition, there are some item types, like, for example, cards, or slicer, or something known as the J-Cutter, which, again, is just a slightly ver stronger version of slicer. Um, that can do the SN glitch to get by their lower accuracy. But be aware that they really don't have good accuracy overall. So that can lead to some issues with characters like Fomar trying to land these things. So just be aware of that. So let's talk about the... I would say the core... The, the power three. I've gone back and forth as to what the order should be, as it is even more subjective than the rest of the list that we've talked about. So I have eventually ended up putting Arrest first. I would say it's generically useful against almost every enemy in the game. It's really good to put on hunters. It's really good to potentially also put on forces. I don't think casts need this bonus. They could get away with spread needle. They prefer the hit percentage from spread needle over the S rank equivalency. So they'll take the status hit, for example, in order just to land more specials. But it also requires V501 and slash V502 in order to be effective. So, what do what do people normally use if they're going to get it? It's usually a slicer or the J cutter. So this allows you to basically paralyze entire groups. It hard shuts down creatures like Gerdabulu. Fantastic item. Now note that if you're playing a ranger, you have access to better weapon types. So for example, we're looking at the ES mech gun here, but I could let me go back slightly to the list. I could go to something in episode 2, like the ES Needle, which is a rifle that shoots like the Spread Needle, which is already fantastic. So I can have Rapid Fire whatever I want. It could be Rapid Fire Demon, it could be Rapid Fire Hell, it could be Rapid Fire Demon, or, or Arrest, I mean. And potentially those options are better, so just be aware that Rangers have the option on all of these to do Shotgun or Needle over Slicer. If you're looking to be more efficient with your PDs, Slicer or J-Cutter is preferred, since the weapon you put it on doesn't impact the price. The rank of the special determines the price. So, Slicer is more universal, so you might go for that option if you're looking to give it to a lot of characters. Or if you're looking to just really hard destroy everything, Rangers have some really powerful alternatives. So think about it before you commit what weapon type you use. All of them are useful in different situations. Some are slightly more useful than others. Depends on, for example, if you want the range of a slicer to hit groups, or if you want the ability for the shotgun to have full screen clear, or if you don't mind having a bit of a range reduction in order to just spam it quickly. I would say pretty close contender for number one, if not number one, is the Hell Special. So, if you're not looking to do episode two, this is really skippable. I'm gonna be honest with you, this is really skippable. I know a lot of people are like, wow, it's so good. If you don't play episode two, it is mostly pointless. It doesn't do anything in episode one. I can't think of where I would even maybe use it in multiplayer at all. And episode four, you can in theory use it on like the lizards and rappies. Do you really need it though? I just feel like that's kind of a waste if you're gonna go for that. Like you could use arrest in the same scenario and arrest would work on more enemy types. So think about it that way. However, 
if you're looking to do a lot of temple, a little bit of spaceship, maybe you're doing some seabed, and you just wish for enemies to not exist anymore on this mortal plane, it is really, really good. Hell Needle is probably the best version of hell that you could get for this. So spammable, kills everything. You might use shotgun on certain quests, but again, this is more niche. Um, otherwise, Universal J Cutter slash Slicer SN Glitch for Hell is ridiculous. Imagine that you're basically full screen and you have a normal accuracy attack that will potentially kill four targets. That's very silly with V502. That is very silly. Even forces will abuse it, except for Fonural. Because not everybody can use the Slicer and J-Cutter for clarity. So their alternative are cards. So they, they go one attack, one attack, three attack, just like Kunai. And in doing so, they have three chances of landing hell on a single target. So if there's a high priority target, they're pretty good at it. Otherwise, they're not as preferred. Up next, we have Demons. Depending on where you're going, this might be higher priority than Hell. So for example, Demons is really good at, uh, if you're ever planning to do Anguish, I would rate this higher over the other two, uh, because they basically resist status ailments in general. Mech Gun, uh, Demon Mech Gun is one of the best weapons in the game. It's pretty much like the number one or number two pickup most people get if they're going to be doing challenge mode weapons. The reason being that 9 chances of demons is absolutely busted stupid, and the fact that you can also technically SN glitch with it by standing at, a, at pretty much max distance means that you have a fairly consistent means of doing rapid damage. So a lot of endgame areas, so let's say you're not going through seabed or temple or spaceship. Let's say you're doing tower or you're doing anguish or you're doing uh, ruins. Anything with like really high HP and also potentially high defense, or even let's say pan arms in caves, will be deleted by this. This is like the absolute enemy killer. If you put this on like the, the Ramar, you basically have a one-man army. It's like, what is their weakness? Their weakness is Ramar. You're fighting Barans? Cool, you can combo kill Barans. You normal, special, normal, and they die. <laughs> like, it's just completely insane. And again, sometimes you'll prep shots ahead of time. So for example, if you know an enemy's spawning, you could skip your first attack to just go immediately into the second and third attack. And that is really, really, really powerful to do on a lot of these guns. Uh, Demon Needle is fine. I think most of the time people will end up picking the Demon Mech Guns because it's just more universal. And honestly, 9 chances of demons is pretty broken, Chad. Like, it just... I can't understate how much faster this makes really hard runs. But again, if you're only doing things like Farming Surface Episode 4, you're doing, uh... uh I would say low Barans, low Sinos, Mine Runs, Caves, Forest... You don't really need demons there. So you'll probably get more use out of a rest in those similar scenarios. Like if you want all of the Hildebears to be paralyzed, for example, you now have an ability to shut down multiple Hildebears on other characters. So that's why I think I ultimately put a rest a little higher, even though the situations where these can be used are like run definingly good, but they can only be used in those scenarios. They're not like, I can't just use hell in like ruins, for example, or mines. In episode one like it's just it's literally just a dead item also i guess kind of ironically in some sense too you can't use the rest of mines as well but you know what i mean chat i do want to point out that there are other melee ways of applying it so technically you can have the twin blades with higher base accuracy if you're looking to land a lot of hits in melee range Let's see if i could find it there it is so it is a double saber with decent-ish accuracy, so it's a little better than something like Mech Gun with only 10. And most of the time as Hunter, you're going to be in melee range anyway. So again, it's just another great way of reducing health really rapidly. But this would be used more on things like Epsilon or Pan Arms or Ilgil or even to some extent Delbeater or anything in Anguish, honestly. 
Because even with the reduced activation rate of demons, demons only goes up in value because they have more HP. Whereas the others, you get reduced chance and and it also doesn't last as long. So demons will take priority on those kinds of things. So let's go a little further. Let's talk about niche S rank weapons. Zalor is really good to put on things like handguns, slicers, or shotguns uh, for solo play. There's no real reason to use this in multiplayer unless you have a very weird team comp. Very skippable. It's very good in solo play, though. So if you're a solo play person and you want to kill bosses a little faster and you don't have access to debuffs, like let's say you're playing Ramar, for example, or you're playing Rawcast, it's pretty good. Um, I would say in terms of damaging weapons, there aren't a lot you normally take for raw damage, but I do think Berserk Needle is a lot of fun. It's more fun in, like, forest caves, maybe mines. But due to its accuracy, you're not really going to see it in most of Episode 2, and maybe half of Episode 4 it'll be used. Um, similarly, for damage specials, you will not usually see it used often, but if it is, uh, cards with the SN glitch are about on par with Guardiana. So landing three spirit hits on your third hit of cards is actually really good. And the base damage of cards is decent for forces. So they could go there. And finally, we have the most niche one ever. This will be the one that people will probably argue about. I think this is actually really fun in Anguish. I got to test this out a little bit, but if you're not playing Anguish, there's no reason to get it. So just, just, no, just to note it, because being able to survive hits in Anguish is huge. Uh, for certain characters, it makes certain runs doable, so that way you don't have to just, like, frame perfect the entire time. But, yeah, otherwise this is pretty skippable. Okay, chat, we're gonna go very briefly through the Ubers, since I will make a note here. I'm gonna make a special note here, actually. So I'm gonna say... Note, most Ubers are not worth hunting. They are mostly used for show. They are incredibly rare and should only be considered as a final thing to hunt for players. I'm not even gonna be more specific than that. So John wanted me to make a note that most Ubers are not good, and sadly most of them really aren't. So I went through a handful that are like semi-useful. So we have like the... The Ordi Ajito. I think that's how you say that. Which has a little special bonus, let me hide the guide briefly. Where essentially it can combine with Samurai Armor which is a prize you get from uh, handing in the Massive Attack 4 tickets. You get 30% more weapon attack and 20 accuracy. Now this Katana actually gets, or Katana gets really, really, really strong. And I think people will generally not get it because it's a little harder to achieve. However, it also benefits from Proof of Sword Saint. So if you want an ultra gimmicky um, ability to do 1.94 light damage sword that pierces, it is actually surprisingly good in certain runs. I'm not going to call it the best thing ever, but it's definitely more usable than I think people realize. So I figured I'd give a little shout out to that item in particular. Uh, next up is Heaven Punisher. This one, it's probably easier to use Heaven Striker for. It's basically only used to call down the Heaven Punisher, or excuse me, to call down the Divine Punishment special. So this basically frees up you being able to use an invincibility mag instead of the striker unit. So it is useful in that regards. I just don't know if it's worth, what are some sample odds? One in 174,000. Do you know what I mean, chat? Like, if you get it, it, it's good. But like, are you going to get it? <laughs> That's the question you should be asking yourself. Next up, we have the Lava Cannon which is kind of a more expensive show-off version of ways to drain HP. Most players can get away with Gear Soul. This weapon is not mandatory. 
It also, for some reason, has the ability to combine with Zincesta to turn into different weapons, so if you pick up Lava's Cannon, you could turn it into Lava's Blade, or you could turn it into Double Cannon. Sadly, only Lava's Cannon benefits from Proof of Sword Saint, so... I don't know if there's like quote unquote niche cases of why people would potentially want these. Like there's some talk about using Lava's Blade for the HP drain specifically, but I'm gonna be honest with you chat. Most of these weapons ATP will be completely outclassed by other things. So if you really want to hunt Lava's Cannon and a Sincesta, then by all means. Now we have probably the most known uber, I would say, the Psycho Wand. The reason why this one is really good is it gives 30% to Rafoe, Razond, and Rabarda. And while those are fantastic, and it even reduces TP cost by 50%, it's just really too rare, honestly, to say that you'll go for it. Like, people will do purple ID runs for a 1 in 205 chance. Excuse me, for Cave Mill Lily, but also it can be found on things like Redria as a 1 in 299,000 drop. Like, chat, these odds are horrible. Up next, we probably have the other most well known Uber, which is the Sealed J Sword, which, if you unlock it by getting enough kills, it turns into the Sumakiri J Sword. The reason people use this item is that it drains your Photon Blast Gauge, so it is okay as a weapon, it's not the most powerful weapon. More importantly, it can just drain your stuff away. It is a sword, so it can hit multiple targets, so it's not bad, but being able to drain PB means you can kind of fish for invulnerability triggers by constantly regaining PB. So consider doing this if you want some true invincibility shenanigans. Now, I mentioned this in Sesta earlier, so not only do you have to get basically an uber rare of the Lavis Cannon, but you need to then hunt a separate item just to turn it into other ubers. I'm gonna shake my head, chat. These other- I'm just gonna categorize these as other ubers. I'll tell you what they do, but there's no point to using them for the most part. Like, the Book of Hidogata is a very annoying to get item. And what'll happen is if you combine it with uh, Hidogata, the weapon itself, it turns into Dancing Hidogata. I guess I'll make note that it turns into this for people that are curious. It is a super ultra niche, hard to attain card that if you use it, or if you hold it without using it for a certain length of time, then you will be able to do a super damage move or you could just do anything else. <laughs> anyway, we'll move on from that one. Up next, there is the ridiculously rare uh, mech gun, the Gold Mila, which requires two uber rares, the Handgun Gold and the Handgun Mila, to combine together for the mech gun. It's got decent range boost, but yeah, a gush mech gun with 200 ATP and no chance, and basically almost no chance of ever seeing this with hit due to how rare the components are. I'm gonna go... No... <laughs> right, chat? Just... No no thanks. But maybe it interests you. Maybe you want to show off a really uber, rare uber item and don't care about its utility. Kind of similarly, Sange Inyasha is okay. It combines with Blue Odoshi Nimadao. Let me hide that so you see what I'm looking at. And Proof of Sword Saint. So it has the ability to scale. The problem is that Jizai exists and is way easier to attain, so oops. Uh, if you're playing without Episode 4, this is the replacement for Cannon Rouge. It's very similar in power to Cannon Rouge. The problem is that it's a 1 in 18,000 drop for the most part, or a 1 in 28,000 drop. Like, actually heinous, absurd results. Prior to Cannon Rouge existing, this is what you would farm in order to delete bosses. But they decided to make a common version of the Bazooka, I guess. Up next, we have the Prophets of Motav, which for some reason casts Jelen and Zalora as the special, but only at level 5. 
Could you imagine, Chad, if they had just made that like level 35 or something, it would have actually maybe been worth using. It gives a 20% bonus to Rifoe, Rizond, and Rivarda, but I don't get why you would ever hunt this over Psycho Wand, to be honest with you. I guess it's slightly more common, like a 1 in 11,000 Darkbringer isn't the worst thing in the world. But yeah, it's probably better just to stick to the other elemental wands. And then finally we have... A combination with Heaven Punisher. I forgot to grab the name of. It's like the Mili Martou or something? I'm not sure how to pronounce French subtly. But this weapon essentially gets rid of the usefulness of Heaven Punisher. Ophiel Seas is not hard to find. It's it's a rare. You get it from things like Marissa uh, Doubleday, for example. But it's just one of those things where... Sadly, because even though it has Divine Punishment, it doesn't shoot... As much as you hope it would. So, if you were thinking if you have three shots, you get three lasers, sadly that's not the case. If it shot three lasers per shot, it would absolutely be a fantastic BS endgame weapon. But sadly, it is not the case. We're gonna very briefly go over these items. I'm not gonna go into detail here either, since they're just ubers. So if you really care about finding cards that match for your ID, they don't do anything other than sometimes they're used in skins, which we'll talk about in a moment with cosmetics. Uh, here's all the locations for them. They're not useful, but they're there. They're there for you. So, talking about endgame chat, I've listed every single hunt for every single weapon heart across all difficulties here, because you should only really be hunting these once you're at ultimate, and this is just a way of showing off. So, for example, you can make, I don't know, like your Heaven Striker look like Ruby Bullet or something like that. So if you like the graphics of some of the other weapons, I would say the ones that are generally in very hard are somewhat easy to get. The ones in ultimate tend to be awful. I'm just letting you know. So if you want a general rule of thumb of the difficulty of the hunt, it's there. I'm not going to go into each of these because there are just way too many of them. But I also recommend if you're looking to uh, upgrade the look of Red Ring explicitly. This one we'll take a little look in more detail here. a moment. It'll find it eventually. There we go. So essentially there's a quest called the Forge where if you manage to get a red ring and you're tired of your red ring being red, well you can make it look like a whole bunch of other shields. Also note, is there an entry for paint? I meant to check that before we started the stream. Yes. I'm gonna put that there for people that are curious. So you can basically turn your red ring another color, so if you like black, white, blue, etc. Those are there. Or, potentially, you can make it look like a totally different shield altogether. So be aware that there are tons of colors. There's also the platings here, etc. So they're not bad. Unfortunately, the plating requires a whole bunch of items in order to create it. Like, just to make it look like the standstill plating. You need a Yahoo Mag. You need 10 Grass Assassin Sabers, 8 Standstill Shields, 5 Secure Feet, 2 Soul Eaters, which are normally, um... I guess you could get them through the Anniversary event, otherwise they're quest items. 2 Reapicas, which are things you fight, uh... uh in Saint Million, for example. Iron Faust which I want to say is Gal Griffin to some extent, with the by upgrading Panzerfaust. Oh, is it just- oh. Never mind, it's from Baranz. I had the right idea. Wrong enemy. So yeah, there's crazy combinations you could do if you get really bored of what Red Ring looks like. To me, cosmetics are not important, but I wanted to put it there so that way chat could find it. One additional thing that I added here for chat as we wrap up the final part of this video is that I have listed all of the mag cells that you can find in Ephinia. So this is going to tell you what everything looks like, what all of the abilities do. 
So when you're truly done with the game and you do not care about being optimal and you're just like, hey, I want to I want to have devil wings. I don't really care what the bonuses are. Here you go, chat. Here's here's your full list. Now be aware in the guide itself, I talk about which ones are findable in ultimate because there are ones you could kind of find along the way, like Defoton cores from Olga Flow. The Burda Kit is not too hard to pick up if you're playing anything, basically, in uh, Episode 4, as an example. So take a look at these if you're just looking for completion's sake. Uh, take a look at those, or stick to Nidra and Dragon Scale. So now, the final thing, chat, before we say we are done with this part. We, we got through almost all of it. I'm going to showcase this. We're not going to go through the full list, or else chat will probably scream in agony. But I have developed a spreadsheet that is slightly off screen. Let me fix this. Let's do something like this. Yeah, that's better. So I've developed a spreadsheet where essentially I categorize every item based off of our discussions in Rags to Riches. All the subcategories, if it's a hard, an enemy part, part of Claire's deal, if it's a sealed item, I mark it. So we're gonna look at the... Oh, that actually almost fits on stream with the mobile-friendly version, nice. So I have marked every single possible item that we have covered, minus maybe a couple that I added, like, literally on stream now. Uh, that can be found for your ID. So I will go back and double check this. This will be updated uh, since we did add some things since we um, started the stream. But essentially, if you're looking to get an understanding of what things are end game, what things are good for fresh starts, what things are niche, which things are cosmetics, I have like several hundred items here that if you just want to see what you get in a run, for example, if you want to do, let's say I want to see everything that is related to TTF or something like that. I realize I'm in the wrong one. What we'll end up doing, let me go back here, is that we will go forward and you can filter this in order to find what you need. So if I just want to see, let's say clear all, I just want to see what, what can I find in like CCA, for example. Although that's not labeled correctly with the episode, I'll get to that later. Let's say you want to look for something that's in, like, Spaceship, for example. Maybe that's a better example. I have all the drop rates of everything. And if you want to go more in-depth with it... Let's scroll the list. I created a list of all the drop rates and rare rates. So, one thing that really bothers me about the Affinia Wiki is that... While it does provide it, it's not mobile-friendly. So what do I mean by that? I can't really check the percents of, like, what makes an item the rarity it is to understand if drop rate weak is effective or rare weak is effective. So I have basically made these two tables, and these are the things that potentially the chat can just use directly. Now I'm going to make sure the permissions are all set up, and uh, just let me know if you ever have some trouble with it. We'll correct some of the category names, I think that's just an issue with the uh, labeling of the items. But we have everything we already talked about minus God Hand, I think, was one of the items we added as an example. I think Red Sword is in here, but I'll double check too. But basically, these are all the things that would be going towards a Clear Steel 5, which we didn't go into much detail with, since those are things that are kind of more post game hunt kind of territory, and we cover that more in Popper's Guide anyway. Uh, but yeah, that covers everything that I wanted to cover. So hopefully, you gain some knowledge as to what things are end game. Hopefully the descriptions of the items helped you have a slightly better understanding of whether or not something is useful. I do want to just point out for like the PC version of this particular list, uh, you can just click around to the different headers if you're looking for something in particular. Hopefully that helps you find something that you're looking for. Because again, it is like a 61 page document kind of thing. And then we also have the Excel for looking up specific things. So if you want to see what a forest caves hunt looks for you, it's there. Is this guide available? It is absolutely available. It is on our Discord. I will link this right now in the chat. So hopefully this answers your questions for it. Um, we'll talk a little bit outside of this guide, but uh, I don't have anything I really want to add here. I think we covered in great detail most things. 
And if you want to see the odds of fighting, finding these things, uh, I would definitely compare it. So, for example, if you're comparing against, um, I don't know, even like similar items, like you just want to see what is the best hunt, you could kind of compare around it either by looking up by item name or episode. But anyway, uh, that's it for now. We're, we're going to take a break here. So let's go ahead and say goodbye to YouTube. If you did watch to this point in the video or the VOD, I'd like to say thank you for watching, and hopefully you enjoy the next guide.